All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is April 24th, 2023, and we're just going to keep digging. We're going to keep searching. We're going to keep bringing clarity until the Feast of Weeks of 2023, the true end of 70 years to Father God himself and his count. You know, we got a great count. Um, uh, by our brother uh, Neil in the forum. We have a forum. So anybody, whenever you're, if you're new and you hear me talk about the forum, you can join us over here on our website or you can go to ministryrevealed.com and go to the menu box, click on the forum. You could join us there. Uh, 11, 1200 like-minded brothers and sisters from all across the world, watching, praying, diligently seeking, watching the news, sharing it, all sorts of things in relation to being watchmen for the coming beginning of the end of days. Watching, praying, seeking, sharing, searching, all right? And <clears throat> our brother Neil's got a great count going in there. He shows some great pictures every day and does this, this daily countdown. And I think, oh shoot, I don't remember, 35 or 36 days to go. For anybody that's new and is wondering what date am I talking about, the countdown we have going on is to May 28th, the 8th of Savan, which I believe is the pre-trib escape. It's either the 28th, which is the 8th of Savan, or it's the 4th of June and the 15th of Savan. But I do believe it's the 28th of May. Um, you know, it's not just me saying it. It's been five and a half years of revelation, of digging, seeking, and searching, and understanding that this end time code that was revealed to us and proven out by scripture that starts with 50 days, then 14 years, and then the final 50th year jubilee that is the revelation of the end time code and it all begins in taurus which is the month of savan and so um he's got that countdown going on in there and that's that's what we're that's what we've been seeking we've been searching we've been understanding this time frame but one of the other big keys as you guys all know is of course we have to understand what year what year was it going to be and We've now been able to reveal and understand how the 70th year of Israel was to be counted. We got it through Luke 13. We got it through Leviticus 19. And we know this year that we're in. And we see all these events, everything going on around the world. We see the clarity of revelation that just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And I'm going to show you some more clarity and some more detailed revelation connected to the time of Christ, directly giving us his birth and the year of his birth, the count to when he began his ministry while John was yet there, and then when he officially took over and the count began where it was just him and everybody was then turning to him. We shared on this in the past, but I'm going to show it to you in a, in a, in a more, in, in a brighter light that was shone on it, and I came to understand it about a week ago, when I was doing a chart that you guys have come to know very well, we've made adjustments over the years, but you know, we came to understand this chart and put it together. Uh, our brother Ivan did this for me because I suck at using all these different charts at building them. But what I had done, as you guys would recall, I knew that there were two Sabbath years remaining, two Shemitah years, which are the final years, the seven of seals and the seven of trumpets. and I thought, well, what if we counted all the way back to the birth of Christ? And as we did that, we realized there were 289 Sabbaths. And it was that 289 number that brought us to the final seventh year Shemitah that would be the final year before the next set of seven and seven in the end of days begin. Well, that is what led us to Luke 13. That Jesus said, look, three years I'm come. There's no fruit on the tree. Cut it down. The, 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 the vine dresser says, give it one more year. I'll dung it about. And if it still doesn't produce, then, you know, so be it. We'll cut it down. That, was the, that began the revelation of the three plus one more year that then led us to Leviticus 19 when you come into the land and all of that stuff. All right. Uh, which, which is all detailed right here in how to understand it. So we're going we're gonna to get into this. We're going to talk on that. And I'm also going to give even more confirmation, more scripture confirmation of, of the piece we've been talking about just recently 
about how Jesus is going to show up to his disciples first, right before the escape, right before the pre-trib. There's enough evidence biblically that shows he's going to show up first. I don't know if he's going to gather them. I don't know if he's just going to spiritually, you know, be before them, if angels are going to be sent. I don't know how it's going to play out. But they are going to be informed right before the pre-trib escape happens. All right. So you guys will see that. I'm going to give more detail on that. And what was really interesting is it was a reminder. It was something that just came back into my memory of something that we had taught in the past about the revelation of the seven churches for the end of days, which we've revealed here in this ministry as well. That was a huge mystery that, that's been around. People have been seeking it for hundreds of years, and we have the revelation here as well. So those are the things that we're going to touch, in, uh, touch on and, and get digging into. And anybody else that's new to the ministry, like I said, you can join us at the forum. You can support our ministry here in the West and also our ministry that we have with Steve over in Uganda. Bibles are going out. The, the ministry revealed is being printed in Uganda and there's been hundreds and hundreds and they're actually out and trying to get more done because people keep asking them. Um, so you can support the ministry here with GoFundMe or with PayPal as well. And for those especially who are new, and you hear things like 14 years, you're going to think I'm some drunk crazy. Well, it's not, okay? It's not true. I used to be, but I'm not anymore. And you're going to realize that the revelation of the end of days is truly two sets of seven years. And the only way it was ever revealed was you first had to understand what's called, what we call, revealed in the Gospels, okay? who the Gospels are speaking to. And we have a playlist right here. You click on the playlist on the tabs on YouTube and you come to the Revealed End Time Study Note series. Click on this. And you're gonna see these three top videos right here are the number one videos to start with. Um, I told you in the last video, I'm working on a, an intro to the three intro videos. So I'm gonna do a brief, as close as I can to 15, but less than 20 minute video about a, a brief insight as to what these three videos are about. Kind of like what I chat a bit about here, but I always kind of add a little more or go this way or go that way. And it's gonna be a new page on the website. Our brother Jimmy's working on it for tomorrow to get the web page done. Then I'll get the video done and we're gonna post it there. And it's gonna be called The Intro. That'll be the page on the website, uh, hopefully sometime later this week or, you know, within the next uh, couple, three days. Um, so that would be a great video to be able to share with people, a 15 or so minute video to talk about these three videos right here without having people have to come to, to see big videos that are two, three hours long and change and, and think, oh my goodness, I got to watch that to get the intro. No, we're going to do a separate intro just for that. And it'll be great and easy to share for everyone because this is the revelation right here. These pieces right here, starting with video one, which we call who the gospels are speaking to. If you've ever wondered why there are these quote unquote discrepancies within the gospels, if you've ever had questions on them, if you've, if you've ever asked a pastor or somebody, why does it say, you know, a white robe in Luke, a, a purple garment, in Mark, a, a, a scarlet robe in Matthew. Oh, it was just different perspectives, your pastor will tell you. It's not true. Is there, is there a reason for it in the is with some of these quote unquote discrepancies? Yes, but many of them cannot be explained away by saying perspective. You know, there are so many within the gospels, when you really dig into it and you begin to understand these differences, it is going to blow your mind because the answer to who the Gospels are speaking to is that the first will be last and the last will be first. What we read as Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the Synoptic Gospels will become Luke, Mark, and Matthew. That's why in Luke, Jesus was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful, like a bride, right? Mark was in purple and Matthew was in purple. Purple and scarlet are tribulation colors, right? The woman riding the bees, purple and scarlet. White is a bride. And what you come to see, and you're going to understand in these differences within the Gospels, is you're going to realize that 
pre, mid, and post is also true. Luke is pre-trib, Mark is mid-trib, and Matthew is the post-trib. You see, all of these debates, all of this back and forth, and it's because all of them can show their positions with Scripture. Why do you think that is? Because all three of them are true, and it starts with white, radiant, gorgeous, which is Luke. And you're going to see as you begin to, to go into this 30-minute Bible study, it'll start to open up to you. You can go to ministryrevealed.com. You can download the book on free PDF. You can listen to it in, uh, in English on the website. You can even read it from the website. It's in PDF in five languages on the website. Or if you want a paperback, then you'd have to go to Amazon to get it. But then you're going to go after this. You can go read chapter one and really get into the details of this revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. And in an upcoming video, maybe the next one, the one after, um, you know, God willing, depending which one, I want to spend a whole video just showing all, as many as I can, of these differences within the gospel. So many of these key ones, because what it comes to reveal is you realize that there are pieces in there that we didn't even know were prophetic. We didn't even know that they were considered differences until you reveal what the differences are and you see just a couple changes in words. And it changes the context. It changes the timing. It changes the group that it's speaking to. And it's going to blow your mind. What is the revelation of it? It's all about the is to come. This is about ministry. This, this is ministry revealed. We've been given the revelation of Jesus Christ. Does it mean we know everything? Of course not. But more than at any point in human history, the mysteries of the is to come have been revealed here in this ministry. And it continues week in, week out, more and more and more. Some of them are so mind-blowing, it, it, it's even hard to comprehend because we can even show the creation story. We can show the creation story to the end of days. We can show the three discourses of Luke, which represents the 40 to 50 day period. We can show Mark's seven years, Matthew seven years, and take the three of them in order, Luke, Mark, Matthew, to the creation story of in the beginning, light, and then flesh. It's absolutely bananas. All with scripture. The second video, once you realize who the gospels are speaking to, you're going to realize, oh my goodness, if there's different portions for different groups, right? Like, like a harvest model, there's a first fruit, there's a main harvest, and then there's corners and gleaning. That's the way the Lord works his harvest. The first fruits is the Luke. The main harvest is the, is the majority of the remaining 90%. That's the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. That's why it's between the sixth seal and the seventh seal. <clears throat> and then you have Matthew's group, which is the corners and gleaning. Okay, that's the layout. And when you begin to understand this differences in the Gospels, you're going to realize there was a seven-year period missed. And when you realize this seven-year period was missed, you're going to say, well, how did that happen? How did we not realize that there were two sets of seven? And that's all revealed in the third video. And it's a big video, but it's awesomely detailed because you're going to understand it's all because for centuries and centuries and centuries, we have all been taught from the perspective of Matthew. We've been taught from the perspective of Judah, of the house of Judah to the Jews, not realizing that Mark is written to the, what we call sometimes the sleeping church. Those, they might proclaim Christ, but they're not ready. They're not watching. They're not diligent. They're not in Christ, but they might believe. But it also includes the rest of the world. The, the, the house of Israel and the Gentiles that have been grafted in. And then Luke is speaking to his bride. Luke is speaking to his first fruits bride, that, that portion that is in Christ. And you'll even see the answer to the 14 years in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says above 14 years, first group, third heaven, second group goes to paradise. And then the third time he says, I'm coming to you. That's a pre-trib taken to the third heaven, a mid-trib taken to paradise, and his post-trib return, feet down on the Mount of Olives. That is the typology that Paul is talking about in that story. It is prophetic revelation being understood. And this, it's all because of Matthew. You're going to realize 
that with all of our foundation having been grounded in the gospel of Matthew for centuries, our perspective of everything else we look at, in particular in the prophetic as we share here, is hidden. That's why there's disputes. Is it pre-trib? Is it mid-trib? Is it post-trib? I used to bounce between mid-trib and post-trib every couple of years because there was so much evidence for both. The, the post-trib feet down was obvious, but this mid and, po this mid and pre was, was something to just cause, get you to go crazy sometimes when you look at it because we're trying to discern things by looking at only seven years and yet seeing pre, mid, and post. Once you realize who the Gospels are speaking to and you realize that it's 14 years and the first group goes before the 14 years begins, you're going to understand all of the revelation that's in this video being all because of Matthew. It's, it's phenomenal. Just those three videos alone will begin to open up your understanding so much, you're, you're going you're gonna to shake your head and you're going to say, oh my goodness, how could this not have been known earlier? Well, it wasn't the Father's timing. It simply wasn't the timing. That's all we can say. I used to think it was the churches. Maybe they hit it. I don't think so. I believe it was all timing. Just like Daniel chapter 12, I think verse 4, seal up the books till the time of the end, right? That's what's happening here in this ministry. They're being, the, the book is being unsealed. It's the revelation of prophecy. But to also understand prophecy, guess what? It's going to lead you all the way back to the beginning because whoever finds the beginning finds the end. And Thomas tells us, and shall not taste of death. And we know how exciting that is, right? It's awesome. You know, <clears throat> I wasn't going to, I was thinking of sharing this and I was planning on it. And then I thought, well, maybe I won't, but you know what? I'm going to share it because it's just a great little analogy. And it's what happened with my son here uh, late last week. My son started working uh, a job uh, for his kind of like a family. We call them uncle, right? They're close, very close family friends. And he started working for him uh, at the beginning of the year. So he's been saving up money and he bought a car. He's, he's a good driver. He bought a used car, right? Paid cash and has a used car. It's a great car. I helped him find it. And <laughs> he, he's been driving and there was no, there hadn't been snow since he had started driving it. And there was no slush or anything, no water on the ground. So everything was fine. Well, he comes home, I think it was Friday night or Friday uh, afternoon, and he, he has me come outside and he's trying to say he wants to make sure that where the washer fluid goes in, uh, you know, is this the right spot? And I tell him, yeah, it's the right spot. So he pours it in because he's like, oh, I was driving and he says the, I, I, the washer fluid wasn't working. You know, there, there's no washer fluid coming out. And so for me, I mean, he took his driver's ed, right? He took his driver's ed. He did all of his driving course and everything else. And he drives sometimes. So the assumption is, well, he knows, of course he knows how to use his wipers. It's part of driver training and everything else, right? So, and that day on, I think it was on Friday, there, it had rained just a little bit throughout the day. And so his windshield would have just been an absolute mess. So there would have been no way for him to drive home to work and then home and and been safe i mean it would have been just crazy to try to get home with all the mess on the window if only your wipers are going and you're not using the washer fluid so my assumption was that he must know how to use the washer fluid with his wipers so okay this is where you pour it now go back in the car and turn it on and he's like the wipers are going he says but it's not working so oh, thinking he knows what he's doing because what does he say oh i know what it is i know how to do it God, come on, I know how to drive that. I know how to work my car. Sound familiar, right? Ah, I know what it is. I know how it works. I, I know what it is. Yet, yet 50 year old dad who's been driving for over 30 years, you know, assumes at least the basics he knows, right? Kind of like I would think, you know, after people have been here for a while, they, they, they should understand that the 50 days are a fact. It is 50 days, 14 years in the 50th Jubilee. It was literally confirmed by the Holy Ghost, the one thing I've received from the Holy Ghost knowingly. But same type of thing, right? No, no, it's okay. I know, I know. I'm like, okay, well, must know. So I said, you know what? You need to call your friend who's a mechanic and go see him as soon as you can to get that fixed because you're not going to be able to keep driving around like that, <laughs> especially if the roads stay like this. So 
he goes out later that night and he goes and talks with his friends and his mechanic friend is there with him and he starts telling him about it. And my son comes home later that night and he's like, oh, dad, guess what? I didn't realize you had to pull the lever forward to get the sprayer to come out for for the uh, washer fluid. I thought maybe the, the thing was dead, right? The battery, the pump for it was dead and he needed to get it fixed. No, his friend jumps in the car and pulls it forward and everything's working fine. My assumption was he already knew it because, hey, he's been, he's trained in it. He's been understanding, you know, he's been with his dad. Of course he knows how to do it. You see, so you get that assumption, right? Like people with, with, um, with, uh, um, you know, just, you, you, you think people understand everything. You believe and you hope that they're getting it. You know, discernment. And everybody thinks they have discernment. They may have discernment in, in parts and pieces and everybody has a little bit of discernment. You know, it's like my son, he's got some discernment in, in driving his car and being a good driver. But then there's the assumption that the discernment fits in everything. But it doesn't. And so what does he do when he came home and he told me? He says, he tells me the story and he's like, oh, it turns out it did work. I didn't realize. I saw where the word mist was and I thought you just did a little twist or something. And so it wasn't working. So we're happy that it's working and everything's great. But when I, when I talk to him about it, because, oh, no, no, dad, it's okay. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. What do you think he did when I said, see, I'm telling you, you don't know everything. I know you're 20 years old and you think you do, but you don't yet know everything. And even though dad doesn't know everything, dad knows how to use washers. All right. Dad, dad knows how to do a lot more things with the car than you do. And what does he do? Gets all defensive. Gets all defensive, right? Oh, dad, no, come on. I really knew what to do. I mean, I just hadn't done it on this one, blah, 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 blah. I didn't really really, you know, and everybody gets, there's a defense that takes place and, and have to defend your position. You see, I'm not interested in defending position. If, if there's a lack of discernment, have a conversation, right? Ask for help. Maybe I'm not seeing this. Maybe I'm misunderstanding this. Why does it have to always turn into a thing? You see, I, I just don't get it. You know, we, we give room. People could share. We're not against anything in the ministry. There's maybe a few channels we don't like to share in the forum, but there's just like two or three. That's about it, you know, and we leave it open. Some people believe we're one month off and some people believe it's, it's a month and two weeks, but what do you do when things like that pass, yet you believe it's this year, you see? What about the Taurus revelation? What about the 50 days and the Taurus, which was all confirmed by the Holy Ghost? What about that discernment? <clears throat> to me, it's just obviously, it's just not believed. And if some choose not to believe it, that's fine. But then how, how do we continue to, to keep bringing in confusion and showing this, 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 that to everybody else? When we're all trying to be on the same page. Right. It's it was such a it was such a great connection in showing this with my son because I was I was explaining it to my wife and I'm like, this is just life. Right. This is what happens. And then my son's going with his girlfriend today and they're going to Banff to the mountains and they were going to go do something. But he doesn't yet have a credit card. So I said, well, if you don't have a credit card, you might not be able to do it. So go there knowing you might not be able to and plan for other things because you see. If he had never mentioned it to me, which was fine, if he had never mentioned it to me, he would have gone there with the excitement of being able to do this with his girlfriend. And then all of a sudden, all the plans were shot. And when all the plans were shot, he probably could have gotten grumpy. Maybe she would have gotten grumpy. And you know what I mean? So now they're going with the open mind and with the open heart of saying, OK, this is what we're hoping to do. But now we know we may not be able to do that. So we've got a backup plan and we're going to have fun doing this regardless. You see? being prepared in either scenario, but being on the same page, but having the openness to see more than one direction. And when that other direction is closed, then everybody's on the same page. You see what I'm saying? It's just awesome. It, it was such great analogies. And, and it's all about discernment. And I know, you see, that's, that's why I think scripture is so difficult. Because when we try to share with anybody, I'm not talking here in this ministry, just in general, with other Christians, with pastors, and you're trying to share something that we know 
that they've been trying to understand for centuries in the church, which is who the gospel is, what. There seems to be different conversations going on. And we actually have the revelation of it here. Yet not a single one of them wants to hear it. Not a single one wants to have a conversation or even talk about it. Why? Is it because they think they already know? Is it because even though they know they, they're not fully, they know there's something there, but they can't see it. And when something's brought, they just don't want to deal with relearning. Is it because their board of directors wouldn't allow more things to come in to, to change up these things? I mean, you see, it's scripture is not easy and discernment of scripture is not easy. It has to come through revelation. And I don't mean just the book of Revelation. I mean, it has to come through Revelation, through diligently seeking him and the spirit leading. But we have to test those things. You have to be able to discern and understand within certain other parts of Scripture. How can we discern that this is connected to there? You see, and it's the context. And that's what I've been blessed with here in this ministry. I can't explain why, believe me. I'm just some dude in his garage up in Canada. But the evidence is from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, hundreds and hundreds of times over again. You don't all have to agree, right? All those out there in the churches and the past, they don't all have to agree. But there's discernment that is being understood and being revealed. And if you check it, if you follow it, if you seek these teachings and you pay attention and you study them along the way, you will, in fact, see all these things for yourself as well. So with that, <laughs> I didn't, you see, you see why I didn't want to? I started getting myself fired up because I just thought it was so perfect. And then I'm thinking of my son and my son starting to defend his wrong position. And I was telling the story to my family last night. We had family dinner at our house and there's always like 10 of us right in the family. And uh, I was telling the story. And he's like, I'm dying on this hill, <laughs> you know? <laughs> he just wouldn't relent, even though he knows he was wrong, you see? I loved it. It was an awesomely frustrating story. <laughs> <clears throat> now, let me get going into this portion here. Let me show you this. We've talked about this a number of times, but I wanna bring some clarity because what I'm about to show you, what, and what I'm, I'm breaking down for you in doing this, is I'm leading you to a, a, a greater clarity of that Shemitah year count and from the birth of Christ to when he began his ministry. And we can literally now see it right smack dab, right in that time frame of the Feast of Weeks, but clearly in the years that they happened. And one way I want to start by showing that to you guys is what we have known here in Psalms 90 and 10. You see... <laughs> I, I see it all the time with other channels and sometimes I see a post in the in the forum and because we're like people think well we're we're coming up on 75 years for Israel but we're really not in the Lord God's eyes when they came into the land and planted the trees and then you know their government was in place and then three years uncircumcised for the food they couldn't take it fourth year to the Lord and then the fifth year forward was theirs that began the count but when people see 70 to 80 years, okay, the days of our years are three score and 10, that's 70. And if by reason of strength, they'd be 80. <clears throat> so what did you used to hear people say about this, right? Last year, year before, all the time. They would say 70. So everybody was looking for 70 until what they thought 70 had passed. But we had diligently stayed on that for over five years now. You'll hear other people say, see, cut off and we fly away. And they think this fly away means us. They think it means pre-trip. Well, if that's the case, then you gotta wait till Israel's 80 and then a soon portion and then fly away. And then you'll hear other people now because we're in the coming up on 75 years from when they came into the land in 1948 specifically. And they'll say, well, 70 to 80. So maybe we gotta wait till 80. So maybe there's still gonna be another five more years. There's all sorts of twisted ways. It shouldn't be twisted for us here. We have the 100% revelation of Psalms 90 and 10. 70 years. 
and if by reason of strength they be 80 years. So 10 years. You see, 70 to 80. It's 10 years. It's not 11. Even though the number 70 is there, doesn't mean you start at 70. You start at 71, which makes it 10 years. And it says what? Yet it, those 10 years, so if you can go from 70 to 80, those 10 years, those 10 years are going to be pain, travail, wickedness, sorrow. They're going to be the word sorrow, affliction, sorrow, wickedness, trouble, vanity, idols, evil. It literally means tribulation. From when 70 years is complete and 71 starts. But you got to remember, how and when does 71 start? Okay, so that's 10 years. And then you have a soon cut off, which is a short period of time, I believe is approximately, give or take, six months. And then we fly away. This is Judah. This is mid-trumpets when Messiah is cut off and they fly away in Revelation 12, 14 on the wings of an eagle into the wilderness for the final three and a half years of the 14 years. So you got 10 years, about six months, and three and a half years, 14 years. It is all based on 70 years coming to an end. And this is why we've been so diligent on it. It's absolutely everywhere. So why am I bringing this up? <clears throat> to remind you guys of a count. Remember how to count? And I've said before, you know, I kind of feel silly when I talk about this in, the, in how to count it. But it's something we really need to understand because as often... As I haven't shared it all that often. We've shared it maybe three or four times. But whenever I share it, I always say it kind of feels weird to share it because it seems so obvious. But I know it's not obvious. It wasn't obvious to me at the beginning for years. And I know it's not to many others because then I receive emails and comments about people that say, oh, now that makes so much sense. Okay? Here's the example of Psalms 90 and 10. Okay? When 70 years is done, right here. So 70 would be the number placed right here. So 70 is done as soon as 70 years is accomplished, is completed. The very next day, okay? The very next minute after that time is accomplished, you begin your 71st year. When you hit 71, like when somebody, let's say it was somebody's age, and they turn 70 right here. The day after they turn 70, they're already in their 71st year. And when their birthday comes and they turn 71, they're not starting their 71st year. They have already completed their 71st year. And I've explained it this way before. So when you say 70 and 70 is done, as soon as the word 70, 70, boom, it's done. When you start the next year, it's like saying 71, done. So what happens is we get in a habit, and it's all because of how we observe our birthday counts. Because birthday counts are the main counts of years throughout all everybody's lives, that is what has twisted everybody's thinking. Because when it comes to years, you see, when 70 is done, you're automatically starting. So I turned 50 last November, and you would say, well, I'm 50 and a half. You see, that's what we all say. But in saying 50 and a half, everybody thinks you're 50 and a half. When in reality, if we had always just said, I'm six months into my 51st year, or I'm, you know, I'm in my 51st year, that's really the way it should be said. You see? And that is what has confused the counts. That is what confused the ability to number these things, to properly understand the birth and the timing of Christ. There's always this one little portion of gap in account. And we're going to share that. I'm going to clarify and bring that to your attention here today from a piece of scripture that brought it all to light just a, a few days ago, like within the past week. Okay? So what do you see? Soon as 70 is done, 71 begins. And then at the anniversary of 71, 71 is done. So there's two years, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
You see, so it's when 70 is done, you're starting 71. So that by the time 80 is done, there's your 10 years done. Okay, so we're looking at about Feast of Weeks, summertime, right? Approximately of 2023, which would bring you to 2033. Then you have the soon cutoff. So you go from 80, right? 80 is complete. So you're six months into the 81st year, approximately six months. Okay, sometime in the winter of 33, approximately. And then you have three and a half years remaining to the end of 84 years. That's how it works. That's literally how the count works. So I wanted to show you guys these things, just like Daniel 9 right? 70 weeks are determined. So 70 weeks, 70 years are to be accomplished. What do we know these 70 weeks represent? They're years of feasts of weeks, right? Well, guess what? Like we shared in the last video even. How do you know they're weeks? He just said it up here. Daniel chapter 9 verse 2, that he would accomplish 70 years. What do you, so so why would we think that these 70 weeks aren't years when the word weeks also means feasts of weeks? 70 feasts of weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy city. See? Why is 70 so important? The exact same thing I was just showing right here. You see? When 70 is done, bang, everything begins. All right? We know it starts with the 50 days and then the 14 years begin at Pentecost, just like when the church age began at the Holy Ghost. You see, but the story in the Lord God's eyes begins when 70 at the Feast of Weeks is accomplished. But we have to understand how to just count these things that seem so simple. And I'm gonna give you, um, let me show you an analogy of this or, or a, a, an image of this, okay? What happens is we know the Gregorian calendar, when they counted for Christ, they don't use a year zero, right? So look what happens if you remove year zero, okay? If we remove year zero, watch this. Oops, let me zoom back. Let me do this again, okay? If we remove, year zero, you see, because time goes linear, right? The years go linear. They go from left to right, from BC into AD. And the church would say, right, or the Gregorian, there's no year zero. So what they would say is they would say, well, this is the sixth year. There's your completion of six. There's your fifth year, five years done, right? That's what we do over here. This is what we're talking about, that there's your year one starting, the beginning at your birth, and there's your completion at your birthday. There's your beginning of your second year, and there's your completion of your second year. So what they've done by not having a year zero is they've just carried it straight through, but it's completely wrong because they're saying that the sixth year BC starts on this side and ends here. Fifth year BC starts here and ends here. So you get to one BC, one BC starts here and it ends here which of course would then say, see, 1 AD starts here and ends here. But that's not true. This is absolutely completely wrong. And why is it wrong? Because on the BC side, you would say we're in 6 BC and then you have to fulfill it. On the BC side, you would say the person essentially like turned five and then has to fulfill it turn four and then has to fulfill it. The fulfilling of the BC side is to the right. It's not to the left. That's why it's BC. You see, so what the church would say is they would say this is the 1 AD side, uh, BC side, when in reality, this is the 1 BC side. How do you know? because the sun, moon, and stars tell us there is a zero. You see, astronomically, there is a zero, just like there is a year 2000, just like there is a year 1000. 
there was a year zero and there had to be a year zero. You see, does zero actually equal anything? No, because the second, if you just take our Gregorian count and our Gregorian calendar, the second that it went from, from December 31st at 1 BC, December 31st at 1159.99, just as it switched, bang, what happens is you're now starting January 1st, 1 AD. You see, but there's, there's, this is a whole two year period. This is simply the BC side. And so what happens is when you realize that of course there has to be a year zero because it's in the sun, moon, and stars. You see, so it, th it threw everything off. And this is why when we went on Stellarium, Stellarium showed Jesus' birth in 1 BC. It's not on this side of the 1 BC, which is what the Gregorian would show, right? The Gregorian would say, oh, see, it's the other side. And they would say it's 2 BC because they have no year zero. But when you take this out, they're throwing it way over here. And it just messes everything up. When you have the year zero and you realize that you turn the age and then you fulfill it, whereas here you're fulfilling it and then it's complete at the age, it makes complete sense. And we do, we did the year 1000, we did the year 2000, so on and so forth, right? And of course, it's in the sun, moon, and stars. So when we go to Stellarium and we saw that Jesus' birth was in 1 BC, it's absolutely correct. It was in 1 BC at the Feast of Weeks. So now, let's use this as an example. Let's say, okay, let's forget about the, the BCs here. I'm just going to show an example with birth. When a child is born, right? If you go look at these things, just even did a simple Google search and you did, um, when does somebody age begin? And it seems so simple, right? It begins from birth and at one, you've completed your first year. It tells you that everywhere. Why do people even look that up? Because they get confused because they see as every number, they just look as linear and they just look at it as one, two, three, but there's a whole year in between. There's a whole year in between, and it's not just a single number, right? There's 12 months, there's 365 days in between. So to say one is just like saying every year is just, is just a one day. That's kind of the way it's looked at. So when somebody is born, they're in their first year, right? When somebody is born, they have begun their first year. When they get to one and there's a birthday party and the child has turned one and there's this little party with families being celebrated, his first year is complete. It's over. The very next day, he has now begun his second year. You see, it's not rocket science, is it? I can hear some of you saying, well, duh, duh, no kidding. But it's not as simple as just duh, because this has confused so much, especially in relation to the counts with Christ, that you're now going to see in order, because this begins the year, this at the birthday ends it, this begins the year, this at the celebration birthday ends it. You'll see what I'm getting at. So watch this. Let me show you this in relation now to the chart. So if anybody's wondering, from the last chart that I had shown, all I've done was made an adjustment from the sixth year of a Shemitah year count to the minus two to minus one and the zero that was here. You'll, you'll notice in the last video, it seemed a little confusing because I was saying, minus two to minus one, and I'd say zero because on this side is his birth, right? Is the beginning of his year. And this side on the right is the end of his year. So when I had minus two to one, I had one up here, but it was zero down here because the start, he was zero. When he completed it, he was one. So when he started here, I was saying this is one. When he completed it, there's two. When he starts here, it's two. When he completes it, it's three. So he starts three here. Well, 
when you realize this one piece of scripture I'm going to be sharing with you, you're going to realize the fact that it is bang on in the Shemitah year of Christ's birth and his first year, everything else fell perfectly in place. And you know what happened? None of the rest of this chart was changed. None of it. It was the understanding of the timing of his birth, which was when the year begins and when it ends for a birth. So if uh, you know you turn 30 years old, this was your birthday. Well, that's the end of your 30th birthday. You began your 30th birthday after you completed 29. The very next day is the beginning of your 30th year. That was the clue. That was the vital clue. So what you're seeing here, I'll blow it up for you. This is just saying, you know, what these colors I've used here are for. Okay. So what you're seeing here is Jesus was born at about the time frame of the Feast of Weeks. Okay. So this is the Feast of Weeks on the left side. This is the Feast of Weeks the following year on the right side. So Jesus was born on the third month, 15th day, right? We showed that. We know it from the Star of Bethlehem. It's been proven every which way now from Sunday. Jesus was born 15th day of the third month. Now the question is, or, yeah, 15th day of the third month. So the question is, is that really the Feast of Weeks? And is that where the 50 days is beginning? Or is it beginning the week before and is the week before the Feast of Weeks? And this is just to the eighth day, which is his birthday. And we showed in the last video why that was important because we've known Luke in order for like close to four years, three and a half or so years now, that we have known about Luke in order, chapter one, two, three, four. And we're gonna touch on, on one of them again. But we know this in order. It's like the pre-trib escape, the 40 days of the Son of Man, his return at the end of the sixth year of seals, and his return at the end of the sixth year of trumpets. All laid out in Luke one, two, three, four, in the prophetic end time understanding of why Luke was saying he understood these things in order from the very beginning. So when we see in Luke chapter two, knowing that Jesus, it's a typology of his 40 days at his birth. And we've understood the revelation here that within the 50 days, the son of man is returning on the eighth day as the son of man, not running around declaring he's Christ, but as the son of man, He's going to be warning, as Jonah did, doing signs and wonders. The world is going to think he's the Antichrist. And after 40 days, he's going to be gone. And the world is going to say, uh-oh. Antichrist isn't only here for 40 days. So who was that? You see? But these disciples that will be with Christ will know it. And there will be others who will come to, to faith because the pre-trib has happened and craziness has already been unleashed, right? Well, we also know from Isaiah 9, as we shared in the last video. Isaiah 9 is just a goldmine for us of, of confirming revelation because we see there's the light affliction in northern Israel in two cities. Then a child is born unto us and unto him, you see? And then you've got the big affliction by Syria right after that. It's literally, I love that piece of scripture so much because it's literally the revelation of the first attack at the start of 50 days after the escape. It's the Lord coming as his birthday to begin the 40 days on the eighth day. And then when he's gone, three days later, after the Holy Ghost anointing, bang, Syria comes and destroys Jerusalem and they're removed from the land for the next seven years. It's, it's, it's awesome. But why was it exciting in this connection? Well, because it's also connected to showing Christ at his birth. Is Christ, did Christ show up there at his birth? No, he showed up there as a grown man in that connection from Isaiah to Matthew 4. Well, there's a prophetic revelation to it too, and it's connected to the time of his birth. That's why I believe the 15th, even if it is the Feast of Weeks, the first seven to the eight days before are the ones that relate to John the Baptist, which is why you have the birth of John the Baptist going to the eighth day of the circumcision, which is the eighth day when the Lord starts his 40 days. Luke in order. <coughs> so we know that Christ was born third month, 15th day. So this is Feast of Weeks of his birth in 1 BC. And this is the Feast of Weeks of his 
first year complete at the Feast of Weeks in year zero. One year completed, okay? Birth, birth, one year complete. So when you come up here, he's now one year old at the Feast of Weeks in year zero, okay? In one, in, uh, what would you say? In one uh, uh, um, AD, at the Feast of Weeks, he's now completed his second year. So he's now just turned two, and he fulfills that year from Feast of Weeks to Feast of Weeks, and now he's turned three, okay? When you follow this all the way up, look what happens. You're going to get at what would be maybe like a conundrum, <laughs> right? You're going to be scratching your head because there's a very important piece of scripture that we have revealed here in Ministry Revealed, and it's been confirmed by the coins in the Shroud of Turin, and it's confirmed by the years of Tiberius Caesar, and it's confirmed by the age of Christ. So if somebody doesn't believe it, I don't know what to tell you. We have scripture, we have historical evidence, and we've got historical, literal uh, uh, um, coin evidence. And all of these things are directly related to Luke chapter 3, every single one of them. How this came also to be understood was the revelation of the end of days. We're going to touch on that. It's been a while since we talked on that, but we're going to talk on that as well, just briefly. So look at what happens. You follow his age, you follow his age. At the beginning of 27 AD, right? So at the Feast of Weeks, 27 AD, he completed 28 years, right? He celebrated his 28th year birthday. So from the day after at Feast of Weeks, the day after until Feast of Weeks 2028, Jesus completed 29 years. You following me now? You see why this is so important? This is where you begin at your birth, your first year. This, at your birthday, is when it is completed. This is the start of your second year. At your birthday celebration is the completion of your second year. <clears throat> and that's what we're seeing here. So in 27 AD, he had completed at the Feast of Weeks, 27 AD, he completed his 28th birthday. In 27 AD, at the Feast of Weeks, or you could say that day after the Feast of Weeks, until the Feast of Weeks of 28 AD, Jesus completed his 29th year. So at the Feast of Weeks, or day after Feast of Weeks, in 28 AD, what did Jesus begin to be? Well, he began his 30th year, didn't he? Are you following what I'm saying? In the beginning, at the Feast of Weeks, or see, the Feast of Weeks in 2028 was his birthday. So it was his birthday for what? Having completed 29 years. So no different than the 70th. When the 70th year is done, and somebody would say, oh, it's the, 70, it's the 71st year in six months. Well, really, it's not anything to do with the 70th. It's six months into the 71st year. 70 is already done. It's the exact same context. At the Feast of Weeks of 28 AD, Jesus completed his 29 years on earth. On the Feast of Weeks, or I guess the day after the Feast of Weeks, in 28 AD, what does that mean? That would mean Jesus began to be what? He began at the day after Feast of Weeks, 28 AD, Jesus began his 30th year, right? It couldn't have been his actual birthday when he turned 30 because then he's not beginning his year, he's ending it. You following me? He's ending it. So the day after, at the time of the Feast of Weeks in 28 AD, <clears throat> what can be said 
about that time frame. So that the Feast of Weeks of 28 AD or the day after a Feast of Weeks in that time frame, shortly after the Feast of Weeks, Jesus what? Jesus began to be 30 years of age, did he not? Yes, he did. Let me show it to you right here. Talk about a nitty gritty detail of revelation in this. In Luke chapter three, this is what we've shared in the past. In the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar's reign, right? Well, we know because the coins on the Shroud of Turin, the coins on the Shroud of Turin, because of all the laser and technology that they have now, that they've had for years, they've got so much precision. They could see the energy that came from it, and it, it actually gave all, oh, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And it absolutely was the Shroud of Turin. It, it is the wrapping of Christ. So, and we've been able to prove it from many other revelations as well. But what happened is the coins that were seen that were imprinted from his eyes, they saw that the marking on it, as we shared in the past, the markings were from the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar, and they were stamped 29 AD. That was the meaning of the stamp. It was 29 AD, which was the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar. Okay. Well, this is the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, which means in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, it was 28 AD, not 29 AD, because in 29 AD was the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar. So the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar would have been 28 AD. So here we are. Jesus begins to be 30, which means he didn't have his birthday. He was just starting his 30th year because began means start. That's right. It was what? Jesus began to be 30 in 28 AD, right? Which was the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And in 29 AD, it says that those coins were the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar in 29 AD, which means 28 was the 15th year. Well, if you follow what scripture says, in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, what do we read about Jesus? Luke chapter 3, verse 23, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Have you ever scratched your head on that one? Have you ever looked at that one over the years and just wondered, what's with the strange wording? I have. We've talked on this many times over the years. It's one of those ones, it's it's a head scratcher. But you know what the assumption has always been? The assumption has always been He turned 30. We'll use this three as 30. So he turned 30. You see, the assumption is he turned 30. And then this side is the rest of his year. It's not even possible. Do you understand that? It's impossible that he literally had his 30th birthday and then it was in his 30th year. This is not the beginning of the 30th year. At the end of 29, day one after his 29th birthday is the beginning of his 30th year. Not maybe. I'm not making it up. It's a fact of life. So when we see this wording that says began to be, for, for a few years, I was no different than everybody else thinking, okay, He turned 30 because that's what we do. That's why I said that earlier about what we do with our age. We we take it to our age and we say, ah, I turned 50, so now I'm 50 and a half. No, I'm in my 51st year. I've already finished 50. You see that? It's wild. But the assumption is that Jesus had his birthday of 30 years. He didn't. He had just started He just began to be 30. And it's literally in the wording. To commence. To commence. To begin. It's literally about beginning. First in rank, of course, connected to Christ. It's all about 
beginning. How about when we go to the creation, right? What if we do this? Look at this with John 1. We know that in the beginning was what? In the beginning was Christ, right? What, was, was he already there forever and ever at the beginning? No, this is the beginning of creation. Was it the end of creation? No, it was the beginning. It was the start of creation. And it's the word G746, chief this beginning, because it's literally relating to him. But look at the word it comes from. G756, to commence. The word literally means to commence, to start. In fact, just go do a Google search on the word. Look at this. The word commence means start. When do you begin to be 30? You begin to be 30 the moment you finish your 29th year at your birthday. So if you knew the exact moment of your birthday, the second after, you're actually in your 30th year. You have begun. You see? This is this little tiny <laughs> tidbit nugget of, of a word that has just had people scratch their heads forever is revealed in a tiny little word called began to be. Meaning he was starting his 30th year and your 30th year does not begin after you turn at the party. It begins at the end of 29. Man, I just thought that was so awesome because you know what it all does? It puts it perfectly in the Sabbath. I didn't make it fit in the Sabbath. It ended up removing the sixth and put it directly in the Sabbath year to bring us to the exact 289 Sabbath year counts, Shemitah years of seven year Sabbaths, from the first year from the birth to completion of the first year of Christ to the end of the 70th year of Israel. It's awesome. Well, look what else it does. When you realize this, look at this. This is when he began to be 30. And in Feast of Weeks 2029, he completed 30. Okay, so this is his first complete year. He starts 30, he ends 30. Okay, so he's completed 30 by the Feast of Weeks of 2030. Well, some people say, well, then that leaves. That's one year, two years, three years four years and about a half. You trying to tell me Jesus' ministry was four and a half years? Yes, but not the way you think. Do you guys remember what the revelation of this was? It's revealed in the end of days, brothers and sisters. You see, if you remember, when we go to the book of Revelation, and it was the book of Revelation that got us going down this path that revealed to us the understanding of Luke in order. You see, because at the end of the sixth seal, this incredible revelation, when I first discovered this, guys, I was freaking out, right? It's that video about, um, about the, the, what I call it, like the most important video you've ever seen. And it was back, oh, I don't know, three and a half, four years ago. And it was understanding that the Lord is coming at the end of the sixth seal on the heavenly Mount Zion. He's gonna destroy the enemies. He's gonna seal the 144,000. Uh, Antichrist is gonna, be, is gonna be put into the grave. He's gonna be defeated. All the armies coming against him are gonna be defeated. And then the 144,000 are sealed. <coughs> Excuse me, the rapture of the great multitude happens uh, give or take around the halfway through that seventh year of seals. You see, that final seventh year, the Lord is here. He, he's coming in the clouds like Mark's discourse. He's coming in the clouds. This is the Mark discourse mid-trib rapture time coming, which is why in Mark's discourse, and this is going to be part of the intro video, and it's in the intro videos, but what you see 
<coughs> about the coming of the Son of Man in Luke, Mark, and Matthew is we know in Luke, it says coming in, and the word literally means in, and in Mark, it says the clouds plural. In Luke, it says coming in, and it's the same word meaning in, but it's cloud singular. When you go to Matthew's discourse, in Matthew's, it says coming in the clouds plural, but the word for in isn't in. It actually means on. And I know all of you guys who have been around for a while know it, but let me just give that little clip of an insight for new people. Look at what it says. <clears throat> uh, this shall sign a man. See, the Son of Man coming in the cloud. So to read it, it seems like it's the same of Mar as Mark's. But when you use the Strong's Concordance for the definition of the words, the word in, you see, there's the Luke one, there's the Mark one. Luke was a single cloud. Mark's is plural clouds. And Matthew's is in. But it doesn't even mean in, it means on. Like. Seriously, they couldn't say on? Pretty crazy, right? So imagine reading the Bible without the definition of the words. That's why a program like this called eSword is so valuable. And it's free or maybe a couple, three dollars a year, depending what your, your program or, your, or your, your format is, tablet or phone and so forth. And it's not mine, by the way. So they, it, this has been around for a long time. But you see, if you read it without word definitions, you would have no idea that that word is really talking about on. And what do you see? Matthew says immediately after the tribulation of those days. When we go to Mark's, in Mark's, it says slightly differently for a reason. And it says, but in those days after that tribulation. You see, this is the Lord coming as Revelation chapter 6 at the end of the sixth seal. And when he comes at the end of the sixth seal, you see everybody's freaking out, hiding in the caves and the rocks and the mountains, saying, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the, the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. This is the Lord coming as Mark's discourse, as you just saw, in the clouds. The literal in the clouds, plural. He's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. We've shared this a number of times in the past in 2nd Ezra's chapter 13, starting in verse 29. This is the pre-trib escape. Deliver those who are on the earth. Bewilderment of mind shall come on everybody who's left. They're going to plan to make war against each other, nation against nation, city against city. That's the red horse rider. And then all the things of seals will take place that he already just talked about. And then he says, shall my son be revealed? And every man shall leave his own land and the warfare they had against one another. And an innumerable multitude will be gathered together, as you saw, desiring to come and conquer him. But my son shall stand on top of Mount Zion. And Zion shall be, prepared, shall be made manifest to all people prepared and built, as you saw, a mountain carved without hands. This is not the end of trumpets. This is him at the end of six years of seals coming on heavenly Mount Zion. And the whole world in a panic, freaking out. This is him coming at the end of the sixth seal. So what does it mean? He's coming at the end of the first six years. So it's not one seal per year. But when the first six seals are done, six years of seals will have passed. And so when he's seen coming here, it's the end of the six year seals. But there's still one more year of seals. There's still one more year of seals. There's the seventh year of seals, right? And look what you see suddenly happen. The 144,000 have to get sealed first, right? So the 144,000 are getting sealed. They're being chosen from among men on the earth. These are not the pre-trib workers. These are the ones who are going to help the workers of seals bring in the great multitude rapture. And then they're going to work trumpets. They're not working seals. This is why everybody's confused about the 144,000 thinking in a seven-year time frame that the 144,000 are about to go to work. No, they're going to work at trumpets time. You see? At the end of seals. And then what happens? After they're sealed, the great multitude rapture happens. What happens? Why do you think the great multitude rapture is after the sixth seal and yet before the seventh seal? So the end of the sixth seal happens. 
which is the end of the first six years. And there's the Lord on heavenly Mount Zion coming in the clouds. You see, then what happens? Do you see any more judgments happening? When you go to chapter seven, no, he's sealing the 144,000. He brings in the great multitude rapture. And then the, eight, the seventh seal in Revelation 8 is about a half an hour of silence in heaven, which I believe is a typology of about um, uh, six months on the earth. And it has to do with the peace that he's going to make with, with all nations. You see? So this is him coming in that seventh year. But guess what? Did his quote-unquote ministry begin yet no you see you've got one year here of things that are going to be taking place defeating the enemy sealing the 144 bringing in the great multitude rapture right the burying of bones a peace being done and then his work of about three and a half years of trumpets that we revealed and what this did is it showed us that it was about a total of four and a half years from when he comes at the end of the sixth seal till the time he's cut off at mid trumpets. This was what revealed to us what took place in the time of Christ and with John the Baptist. This is what this revelation here is that I'm talking about. He was baptized by John the Baptist when he began to be, when he was starting his 30th year, he was baptized by John the Baptist in 28 AD after he had just started, he had completed 29 and he was just starting his 30th year. He was baptized by John the Baptist. It was the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. You following? So by 29 at the Feast of Weeks of 29 AD, he had now completed his 30th year. What all happened during that year? Well, we know the evidence of the end of days of prophecy and what's going to take place revealed what took place in the is. The was is the Old Testament. The is is from Christ until the moment of the escape. And at the is to come <coughs> is from the moment of the escape forward. And it was the revelation of the is to come that proved to us the things that are in the is and the things that are in the was. These things that have been mysteries that have been so confusing for centuries and centuries and centuries. So look at this. Look at what happens. Many of you guys know this, but this is going to be for newer people. Okay, watch this. Starting in verse, in John chapter 3, verse 23. And John also was baptizing, oh, let's go up a little bit further, in verse 22. John 3, verse 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. Okay, what does this mean? Jesus baptized a few people, but his disciples and so forth were doing mo most of the baptizing. But that also means what? Well, that means his 40 days were ended, right? Because after he was baptized by John, he went into the wilderness for 40 days. So this is at the very least 40 days later, but probably a little more than 40 days later. He had to eat, regain his strength, right? So you're in that range of about close to two months, right? A month and a half to two months. Well, listen to what it says. Continuing in verse 23. And John also was baptizing in Anon uh, near to Salem, uh, Salim, because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. And John was not yet cast into prison. Hello. John wasn't taken immediately into prison. It was approximately two months after the baptism of Christ that before John was taken into prison. That's part of that's the first part of the story, remember? And then because they go to John and his disciples go to John, right? And what do they call him in verse 26? They say, and they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi. You see, they're calling him Rabbi. He that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth all men, and, and all men come to him. John answered, 
and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. Kind of making sense now, right? He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. He talks about the friend of the bride. And then he goes on to say that he must increase, but I must decrease. So what happens? There's a two-month period approximately where John the Baptist is not yet put in prison. And there are still people following John the Baptist. Now, Jesus is quote-unquote begun his ministry, right? He's now started his ministry at his baptism as he's begun to start his 30th year. But John is still around, which means not everybody is leaving John. You see, so John has to decrease so that Christ can increase. Well, then what happens? It's beyond two months because then what happens? John is taken into prison. And what happens when John is taken into prison? It says, Herod ordered the arrest of John the Baptist following his, his outspoken criticism of Herod's marriage to his brother's wife, Herodias. While it meant that John was out of circulation, it appears that his followers were able to visit him and keep him informed of Jesus' activities. The, those followers also brought messages to Jesus. Scholars think that he might have been in prison for about 10 months. It's absolutely true. It was about 10 months, plus the two months that he wasn't in prison equaled how long, brothers and sisters? About one year. From when Jesus was baptized and he began to be about 30 to the time of him coming to the end of being 30 years of age, there was about two months and about 10 months in prison. And while John was still in prison, people were still visiting him. They were his rabbi. Some, of course, were believing in Christ and his disciples, but John had his own. And they weren't going to leave him, even though, remember, even though they heard John say, this is the one who I said, I'm not worthy to, to tie his laces, right? To buckle his straps. And yet not all of John's disciples left him. Pretty crazy, right? There's only two, it says, that turned and then they went to follow Jesus. You would think, you know, this is one of those mysteries, right? I always thought, why wouldn't everybody have just, sorry, John, if you're saying this is the Christ and you're not, <laughs> I'm going over there. Thank you very much. But thank you for all your help and all your baptizing and all you've done for us. But I'm going over there. But that's not what happened. Only two did, it says. And the rest remained with John until what? Until his death at about the time Jesus completed his 30th year. That's why John had to decrease and Christ had to increase. It wasn't until John's death about one year later when Jesus completed his 30th year and that next year started that who now was everybody turning to? John was dead. They all turned their attention now to Jesus and many, of course, remembering what John had said to them. This is the first year while John was still around and Jesus was gathering, preparing, People were drawing in and so forth, but John was still around. After John's death, it was now all Jesus. One year, two years, three years, and more than a half year. So guess what that was? That was revealed by the end of days. We know that he's coming at the end of the sixth seal, and he's going to be here setting things in order, doing these things from, uh, from the rapture group to the, to the silence in heaven and the, the peace on the earth. That's all taking place during that seventh year of seals. His three and a half years approximately of trumpets are going to take place when trumpets begin. This is why when you get to, when we show like, um, uh, Revelation chapter 7, you saw the events that happened. You go to Revelation chapter 8, and we see this about half an hour in heaven. We see this fire filled, right, in the earth. He's casted down to the earth, and then you've got the seven trumpets. The seven trumpets 
begin the seven years of trumpets. Okay, that's the beginning of the seven years of trumpets. Well, when does it begin? At the start of the eighth year. You see, so when you go to our timeline chart, there's your six years of seals. He's here for that seventh year or in the big picture, the 14th year. And then what? Trumpets begin at the eighth year of tribulation when they're going to start rebuilding the city and the streets and everything that was going to be that's going to be built on the foundation that will have only been laid only the foundation will be laid in jerusalem during the time of seals this is when the rebuilding and everything takes place for three and a half the first approximately three and a half years of trumpets but because everybody's been taught from the gospel of matthew everybody thinks that it's antichrist and then he's going to be revealed in there no the lord is going to be overseeing it with zerubbabel whoever the modern day zerubbabel is yeshua is going to be the high priest and king and it's going to be shared in part with zerubbabel because he's overseeing the rebuilding it's awesome so you see it was this one year and knowing that he's here at the end of the sixth and here during that seventh year before his three and a half years start how do you prove that in relation to the end of days well it was the chapters of years to zechariah look what happens at the beginning of chapter 8 of zechariah starting in verse 2 thus saith the lord of hosts i was jealous for zion with great jealousy and i was jealous for her with a great fury thus saith the lord i am returned unto zion and i will dwell in the midst of jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. You realize this isn't him coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. That's, that's chapter 14. This is him coming on Zion. Just as you saw at the end of the sixth year of seals, him coming, him getting things established. And now there he is, the mountain of the Lord, heavenly Mount Zion there. What are they going to start doing then? Well, when we come to, you go further down and we go to Zechariah 8 and, and forward, it says, and I will bring them and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and they shall be my people and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong. You that hear in these days, these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation, which is going to take place during seals, of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid that the temple might be built. And of course, you know this famous one from verse 10. For before these days, there was no man for hire. Uh, there, there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast. Neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set every man against his neighbor. What is every man against his neighbor? Red Horse Rider, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, World War III breaking out. See, everything is there. When does it start? In the eighth chapter, like the eighth year. It's the start of trumpets. So this, this is the revelation that we're seeing here. This is the understanding of it. So he had that one year with John during his 30th year. Then he was on his own one two three and a good more than half of the portion of his fourth year which means what which means jesus in 31 um a.d at the feast of weeks time frame jesus began to be 33 right at the end at the feast of weeks time frame of 2032 jesus completed his 33rd year so at the time of the Feast of Weeks of, 20, uh, of 32 AD, or you know the day after, until the time of his death and resurrection, Jesus was in his 34th year, but that made him about 33 and a half and change years old. He wasn't really 33 and a half, but he was 33, probably closer to 34 years old. But he was in fact 33. You see, what does the world tell you? They'll tell you that he was about 33 and a half years old, right? So he was in his 34th year. It's a fact. 
Yet if you try to do that with the understanding from when he began to be 30 years old, and you try to say it's when he turned 30, there's no way we can properly reconcile this. No way. We've put the count of him beginning to be 30 on the wrong side after his birthday when it should be before he completes the 30th year. And when I figured that out and went all the way back to the beginning at his birth, everything, I mean everything, was literally in line to him being 33 and three quarters or whatever it was years old. He was actually what the world would say. You see, there's the confusion again. They would say he was 33 and a half years old. Well, he was about a half plus years into his 34th year. Because we've also shown in historical documents and the Asian ones, right? The emperor, it was at Passover in Nisan month one where Christ was crucified and resurrected in April of 33 AD. Do you understand what I'm showing you here? <clears throat> I personally myself have never seen it so perfectly clear and in order. Never. There's always been a little you know, something, you know, like, like it would be like, well, then this, this goes, I mean, he turned 35 and I mean, it, there was always this, well, how is it 35 to 36? I mean, if we go from 2 BC and what about year zero or not year zero? And there was always a little something. But we knew the issue with it really went back to properly understanding his birth. And then the clarity came with this because where we already had clarity, which is what brought us to the entirety of the understanding, is we knew that the end of days are the last two sets of seven. You follow? They are the last two sets of seven. So all we needed to do, which is what I had done, was count backwards and see how everything lined up, what it equaled, what it meant, counting back all of the numbers of the Shemitah years back to his birth. And wouldn't you know it? It's exactly in his birth, his birth and his first year. And now we've got the clarity to what it means to begin to be a certain age, not the end of it. And all of this now. So now what we already knew about his first year <coughs> has now clarified everything else. That it was about four and a half years in change. But it was about three and a half years in change of the ministry on his own. And he was 33 and, you know, a half in change, which is in his 34th year in April of 33 A.D. I can't help but get excited by this, you know, because <clears throat> you know what this does, right? It refines the revelation. It refines the evidence. It proves it out even more. It proves out the shroud even more. It proves out Tiberius Caesar and the documentation from, from ancient manuscripts about it lining up with Scripture. It lines up with the sun, the moon, the stars. And all of this was because of a stupid way that we've come to count our years of our birthdays. Isn't that crazy? This is why I was showing you this. It seems something so simple, but we never think about it, or very few rarely think about it, in the actual context, the way it should be understood. Isn't that crazy? Just discerning how to count the year of a person brings about the literal revelation of the birth and year of Christ 
to when he began with John, to when he began on his own and when it all completed. That's wild. I think it's absolutely wild. And you count all of the Shemitah years from his birth to the year that we're in right now, and it's 289. And the one place, as you guys know, but I'm going to share it for new people just real quick, as I mentioned earlier, where does it bring us to? It brings us to the revelation of three years the fig tree hasn't produced. Give it one more year, and if not, cut it down. What is that storyline? It's the story of when Israel came into the land. They came into the land of 1948. They planted in 1949. They planted. So the Lord in Leviticus 19 said, when you come into the land and shall have planted all manner of trees. They did that in February 1949. They didn't have their official government till about March of 1949. We know the Lord, though, is counting feast of weeks to feast of weeks. So it wasn't until 1949 that bang, it's going to start. So this wasn't officially their first year. Does it make sense to anybody? What happened when Christ came? There was, there was an establishing part, right? There was a one-year period. What about with, um, with the end of days? There's like this one-year period in the seventh year of seals. What happened when they came into the land? The same things had to take place. And the understanding of it comes when it was the first year being complete of planting trees in 1950, one year of planting trees in January, February was complete and it was in the first year. It could not have been in the first year if it was 1949. And why not? Because that's when they planted. It started when they planted and it completed the first year in 1950 because they didn't plant until 49. So that's why when you get to the third year of planting, there's the third year anniversary completed of the new year of trees, of the, of the trees being planted. And he said, and it was in the third year. You see, so what do you get? You get the four years and then what? The final fifth year that was for them. So what do you get? Bam. Year one, complete. Oh, look at that. At year one, complete. And there's your Shemitah year count. See? Right to your Shemitah year count. And then what do you have? There's your first year. I didn't make this up. It's literally the count. It's literally the count. All we did was go in reverse, knowing the, the two last ones and said, okay, then let's keep going. Back, 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 back. And look at what happened. There's your Shemitah. Your actual Shemitah years. The actual count. And when the count began for them in year one, at the new cycle of a Shemitah. I mean, come on! You can't make this up when it lines up from his birth. From the beginning of his birth. All the way through the whole storyline to the historical years, to the signs in the sun, the moon, the stars. <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. See, look at that. Look at when you count 70 years in that proper count, which is after the Sabbath, after the Shemitah year, <laughs> the 70 years began. That means the 70th year is going to end in this time frame of the Feast of Weeks. guess what? We also did the count for Jerusalem, right? They had already had part of Jerusalem, but this is when they captured it all and so forth, right? So there was no four years and so forth because they already had it earlier with Israel. So what do you get in 1967 to 1968? Year one! <laughs> and where was it? <laughs> it was a start after a new cycle. <laughs> It's awesome. So then what happens? When you do the count when they capture Jerusalem and you count 70 years, look at where it ends. At the end, not the start of the 14 years, when the 14 years are over, the 70th year of Jerusalem is over. 
I'm going batty now. This is awesome. All these little, little pieces that I, I just don't always pay attention to. And then all of a sudden, you just see everything lined up in here. And I just, well, I, it, 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 do you understand what that means? Do you understand what that means? It can't be any other year. I'm not a thus saith the Lord. I've never received a thus saith the Lord. It is the revelation with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, with discernment, with prophecy. And I do it my best with all the love that I can. I just want everybody to hear it. I want everybody to understand it. And I so hope we can just be on the same page, but I'm okay with, you know, little differences here and there because we're trying to discern it. But what do you do when you lay out the evidence like this? What are you, you going to say? This is awesome. <laughs> I'm so excited by it. I wasn't expecting that much to be there. I love it. All right, let's keep going. We covered that part with Jesus, the, the 14. All right. So now, we're, this is going to now continue and tie into the other piece that we shared in the last video. Remember, when we were talking about this stuff with uh, John chapter 7, you know, at first, you know, it could seem like, well, is it, a, is it kind of maybe a stretch to say that that what we're seeing in John chapter 7, knowing John chapter 7 is a chapters to years, is it a bit of a stretch? Well, we've seen the evidence. We saw what the scripture said. And when, when we know that John is things that happened in the is at that time, but we know there are prophetic insights in every chapter of the gospel of John because he lays out... For those that don't know, he lays out in what we call chapters to years. There are pieces of scripture and evidence all the way through John's book in every single chapter that gives insight into events that are going to take place in the end of days. And the, the only way to be able to start to understand these things is to follow that intro video series. It's going to blow your mind. Those first three are the key, and then you can go into all the rest and start discerning more from there. Then you can go into all the rest of the book. These are all books that have been revealed as lining up with events in them that have, that take place, sorry, give me one sec here. With events in them taking place during the years of seals and trumpets. It's all throughout. And John is one that covers his whole book, 21 chapters, because the story of the end of days is really seven what we call easy years or years that flew by where the spirit is working. He's so in love to get that Gentile bride. He's so in love and excited to get his bride. That And they flew by like days. That's what it's called. And then you have the seven years of seals for Mark's group, the seven years of trumpets. Okay, so when you see the seventh year here in John, and you understand that it has a prophetic connection, the, the question is, knowing that it begins in Taurus, knowing that it begins with the Lord God in the Feast of Weeks, how on earth is John talking about um, the Feast of Tabernacles? When everything else, including his law, keeps telling us it's the Feast of Weeks. Why would John be showing us tabernacles? You see, the, at the, in the worst case scenario, I, I wouldn't go to John because, you see, John is simply a revelation of what we call chapters to years. Is it evident? Absolutely it's evident. But this is, this is a, a real deep mystery in revealing these. But it's awesome to see it, man. We got a detailed video on this, even a newer one, close to two and a half, three hours long. It's incredible, but the, it's still one of those mysteries and it's something just revealed here in this ministry. So at the worst case scenario, I would have to just set this aside and say, what does scripture 
literally tell us in relation to the Lord God's feasts. And the Lord God's feasts tell us it's the Feast of Weeks. Jesus is the Feast of First Fruits, and he is the first fruits of the first fruits of the Feast of Weeks. It's, it's not even kind of, it's not even sort of, it's, it's absolutely true, 100%. That's why I said in the last video, I'm not looking to any other season or time of year. This is it. And the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, revealed that it would be Taurus. It was the whole, the whole revelation of being right on target, bullseye. Aldebaran, the 14th brightest star, represents 50, equals noon. I mean, it's over the top. That's why I kind of shake my head. I can't believe that people still aren't believing that that's true. I have never lied in this ministry. I have never said a lie. Have I been wrong? Yes, I've been wrong. But I don't lie to you guys. That's not why I do this. It's revelation. And I share absolutely everything I'm understanding along the way. That's why you see the entire progression throughout the five and a half years. And it's absolutely unbelievable, everything that we've been given. But it turns out we don't have to throw John 7 aside. Because what John 7 was telling us was what we were talking about in the last video without going into all of that, is that just like we see here in Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 35, it says, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to eat and will come forth and serve them. Okay, this is 100% the Luke 24, two disciples that I believe represent the two sets of 12,000, not in the 144 that we see in Jeremiah 4 at the beginning of tribulation when it's all about to start that represent the good side overcomer of Dan, which is the eagle like Priscilla and Aquila, and the other being Ephraim. Two sets of 12,000, 24,000 that are the ones represented in Luke chapter 24. We know this because in Luke chapter 24, when you go to the end of Luke, you go to the end of Mark, you go to the end of Matthew, you see you've got your three watches here. This is the first watch those who will be girded about, those who are watching when he returns from the wedding. This is the first watch. These are the Luke disciple workers that we call Smyrna. The second watch is the relation to the end of Mark for the 144,000. And the third watch is the end of Matthew, those who are gonna go out during the millennial reign. Now, what does he tell them? This is what's so important. He tells them to be girded about, and when he comes and knocks to open unto him immediately, and he's going to serve them, he's going to sit down, they're going to eat, and he's going to serve them, he's going to eat with them, okay? When we go to the three Gospels, and we go to the, the commission that each three Gospels talks about, oh my goodness, you want to talk about completely different? It's, it's impossible for the church to just talk away the different commissions at the end of Matthew, the end of Mark, and the end of Luke in the, synoptic disc, disc, in the Synoptic Gospels, it's impossible to just say, oh, it's just perspective. They are clearly different from each other because they are prophetic in their revelation of the end of days. And this first one, look at what he's telling them again when he will return from the wedding. So they're girded about, they're waiting when he returns from the wedding, and when he knocks, he's to open unto them immediately, and he's gonna come and serve them and eat with them. There's four key things in there that we have proven throughout scripture that are, that are factual, that are taking place, that are related to the disciple group. One of them, as we said, if we go into Luke chapter 24, we see that he opens unto them their understanding, uh, if we go back a little bit, uh, in Luke 24, verse 30, it says, And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them and took the bread and blessed it, break it, and gave it to them. What did he do? He served them and sat and ate with them. In Mark's 
um, in Mark's commission there, it doesn't happen. In Matthew's, it doesn't happen. He does not sit to eat with them. In Mark's, they were eating already, and he came in, and he railed on them because they didn't believe the testimony of the others. And in Matthew, there is no, there, there's not even a sit down. There's no eat or nothing. You see? It's directly related <coughs> to this Mark group. What else do we know about this Mark group? Well, he said when he returns from the wedding, he's going to have a meal with them. So we've shared this as well. Why is Luke's gospel have a wedding feast and then have a banquet feast? Right? Mark's has nothing. And then Matthew's has just a wedding feast and then no banquet. Because this is the pre-trib wedding feast, pre-trib escape of the bride of Christ. This is what it is. We've talked about it. So anybody that gets taken pre-trib, remember to sit down in the lowest room. And if you are called, then you go forward and you would be brought to a higher room. But remember to sit in the lowest room when you're taking pre-trib to that wedding. When the wedding's over, guess what? He's coming back after the wedding, just like he said in Luke 12. And what is he going to do? He's going to have a feast. He's going to have a feast for the Luke group that didn't get taken. You see? That's why it says, for thou shalt be recompensed. So in Luke 14, 14 now, when you go lower to the banquet, it says halfway through, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Who are those who take part in the resurrection? Those who remain to work and are the ones who put their necks on the line. That's why Priscilla and Aquila, it says they put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles and they're called the first fruits unto Christ. They're the worker, first fruit, remnant worker when the Lord comes at the eighth day, who he pre-told right before the escape. You see, could you imagine the pre-trib happens? You, you love the Lord. You're diligent. You're repentant. You're seeking him. You're loving. And the pre-trib happens. And you never were informed about anything? The pre-trib happens. Tens of millions of people go and you're left. That would be pandemonium panic. <laughs> Could you imagine? This is why Luke chapter 12 in the prophetic is telling them before he takes them and goes to the wedding. And this is what we were talking about in John chapter 7. That the, the insight of these little pieces of verses that we see that what he's doing is he's pre-telling the disciple workers, their time coming at the end. Why would it relate to the end of the Feast of Trumpets or the, uh, at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles? Because Tabernacles is the seven-day feast which represents the seven-day years of trumpets. And that's why when it's over, it's the 15th day or 15th year, which is what? Well, you had the seven for Passover week, which is like the seven of seals. Then you got seven for the tabernacles weeks, which is like the seven of trumpets. And then the eighth day of tabernacles or the 15th year in the big picture is the new beginning. Is the final jubilee. So what is he saying? Why is he talking about that there? Well, we showed why when he's the water, when he comes and he refreshes and renews the earth and, and restores the earth. To, to establish the millennial reign in that 14 end of 14 years. What's going to happen? They're going to be resurrected. They're going to be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. When the dead in Christ are going to rise first. We know who the dead in Christ are that rise first. Right? From Revelation chapter 20, we know that those who take place in the first resurrection on such the second death will have no power. These are the ones that didn't take the mark of the beast. And what did they do? They were beheaded. Who were the ones that were beheaded? I mean, you guys know this like the back of your hands. Who were the ones that were beheaded? Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my own life laid down their own necks. Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also 
all the churches of the Gentiles. And who are they? The first fruits of Achia unto Christ. This is that group in the typology of Luke 24, the Smyrna group, the ones he will meet with first. Why? Because this is the only group that Luke 24 disciple servant workers, the ones that he has the banquet meal with after the seven day wedding, the ones that he said he will come back and sup with and eat after the wedding. They are all the Smyrna workers. They are the only ones who take part in the millennial reign with Christ, ruling and reigning with him. The apostles don't. The, the, the 144 don't. The millennial reign workers don't. But theirs is new Jerusalem coming down. Our, I would say our, I believe some of us, a number of us throughout this ministry, this is a preparation for when the Lord comes and makes these things known. We'll be ready. We'll be prepared, having already been pre-warmed up, if you will, in understanding these revelations. So that when the time comes, bang, we'll be ready. Might still be freaking out a little bit, don't get me wrong, but we'll be ready. <clears throat> we'll know that we have been prepared for this. This, this, is a, this is a reward for this group. They're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And their typology is from the is of Priscilla and Aquila. Look, Aquila even means eagle. That's the overcoming side of Dan. And then, of course, when we go back to Revelation and you go to Revelation chapter 2, <coughs> we see from Smyrna in Revelation 2.8, and we go down to verse 11 at the end of it. And it says, he that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. You see? There's no mystery as to who this group is in relation to Revelation 20 and those who put their necks on the line as his disciple servant first fruits workers. But I wanted to be able to see if we even had more evidence of what we've been sharing here in Luke chapter 12. Because again, we see it from Luke 12 and into Luke 14. So we know that, as I said earlier, let your loins be girded about, that when I return and knock, you may open, and I will come and serve you and so forth, right? We know this is all about the Luke group, for which we just ran through and showed you some of those things. Well, when we went to John chapter 7, the context is different in the sense that what he's doing is he's explaining or giving insight by using the is prophetically is when he's going to show himself to the world, which is when he returns feet down, um, that he's doing things in secret. Do you guys realize that everybody pre-trib, you are part of the mystery? Do you realize that? Everybody who is part of the pre-trib bride of Christ is part of the mystery that was hidden since the beginning of the world. And the workers from it are also a group hidden. Look, do you guys remember this? In 1 Peter 1, right? What did 1 Peter 1 say about this group? Starting in verse 4, 1 Peter 1 verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fate is not away, reserved for you in heaven, who are kept. You see, there's a group that's being kept. They're being guarded and protected right now by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, ready to be revealed in the end of days. You see, verse six and seven, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through many fold temptations. Right now, right? That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it be tried with the fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ Jesus. Remember this appearing of Christ Jesus? It's the word 602. 
We've covered that in the past, right? What is it for 602? Here it is right here. Okay. First Peter 1 7. First Peter 1 13. And look at this. It's only used once in Revelation. And where is it? At the beginning of the book of Revelation about the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. When do you think this appearing is going to happen to these guys? I believe it is directly connected to the pre-trib before, right before the escape, which is why John chapter 7 is informing them of all of these things that they will take part in at the end of tribulation, at the end of the seven days as years of tabernacles, when he returns feet down and the earth is renewed with water going out from the throne when he will show himself then to the world as lightning from one end unto the other. You see, and that appearing is right there used once in Revelation. Well, don't forget about this. Let's go down a little bit further in 1 Peter 1.13. Wherefore, gird up your loins. Huh, we covered that before, right? That's the same conversation. Because this is the same connection to the same group pre-trib that are the workers. Wherefore, gird up your loins, the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end. Look at that. And hope to the end. Uh, for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation, the same one, at the beginning of Jesus Christ. It's awesome. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. It's, it's all about that group right before the escape. He's going to make himself known to them. You see, that was what we talked about in John chapter 7. And we have the evidence from Luke chapter 13 and the evidence of when he returns and has a banquet with them after the wedding in Luke chapter 14. And then that's what we were showing here throughout the, the typologies that were built into John 7. Well, it gets even better. What happens if we go into John 8? John 8, starting in verse 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. Well, that is a reference also as a Gentile woman. Okay? Dogs, Gentile, adulteress. It, it's a form of wording for a Gentile woman. And when they had set her in the midst of them, <clears throat> they wanted, remember, they wanted to stone. Uh, Jesus stoops down, wrote with his finger in the ground. Then we get to John 8, verse 7. So when they continued asking, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast, let him first cast a stone at her. And he stooped down again. And they all started leaving one by one, right? From the midst of her. And in verse 9 of John 8, halfway through, then it says, And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in his midst. Okay, we talked about that, like him being on one knee and so forth. But what was always interesting is what is this doing in John 8? We always thought it should be on the John 7 side, right? But when we're counting feast to weeks, it would be on the 8 side. Remember, we're counting the feast of weeks side. And on the feast of weeks side, <laughs> you still have 50 days before Pentecost. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing the bride brought to him. We're seeing her in the midst. We're, we're seeing the stones throw being talked about because what happens? The only one who could throw the first stone is Jesus. Only he who is without sin will cast the stone. Well, we know what this story is. 
this stone's throw can only come from Christ, which is what we know from Luke chapter 22, which is the only place in the Gospels where you read in the Synoptic Gospels of Jesus saying he's a stone's throw away. We know a meteor is coming during that one week, right? Maybe just before the escape. And then during that one week, some point in that seven day wedding, the meteor is going to strike on the earth and then the Lord will return at the eighth day to start his 40 days. <clears throat> and what are we seeing here? We're seeing this entire context of the pre-trib escape, the stone's throw being talked about, and then what? The Lord showing up for 40 days. I am the light of the world. Then spake Jesus again unto them in John 8, 2, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Remember when I was saying earlier in Isaiah 9, look at the context back in Isaiah 9. There's the first attack, right? The first attack in two northern cities in Israel called the light affliction. And then what happens? They were in darkness and they see a great light. Upon them hath the light shined. <clears throat> Who is that light? For unto us a child is born. And then what happens? Syria comes with those with them and devour and destroy Jerusalem. It's the same storyline. But we'd been looking at it with, it was a little bit off. We needed to look at it on the John 8 side. And I remember a few years ago, we were kind of looking at it like that. Because we were trying to understand what was going on with 7 and why couldn't we see so much more of 8 on the other side? Well, when we go Feast of Weeks to Feast of Weeks, the 70 is done. Look, when is the 70 done of the Feast of Weeks? Okay? These are the seven Sabbaths. There's your seven Sabbaths. This is your John 7 coming to an end. So when the 70th year ends <laughs> at the Lord God's Feast of Weeks, 70 years ends, there's still 50 days to Pentecost when the quote-unquote 14 years begins. So seven has ended, <clears throat> and it seems to end with the story with some insight to him pre-talking to those disciples' first watch people that your time is coming at the end. Your reward, your recompense is at the resurrection of the first resurrection. You see? That was the context of everything being said in that last video. Well, if you remember years ago when we talked about this from John 8, look at what it said in verse 2. And early, well, he went, verse 1, he went on the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning they came to him and they sat down and they listened, right? Well, look what happens when we go to Luke's discourse. We go to Luke's discourse, chapter 21, down to verse 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest that any times your hearts be overcharged with the suffering and drunkenness cares of this life, that that day, you see, so you should be aware of a day, that they, that day come upon you unawares, for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. This is why in 2nd Ezra uh, 13, verse 30, after that pre-trib escape, right, deliver those who are on the earth, it says, and bewilderment of mine shall overtake all that all who dwell on the earth. It's the exact same context in this conversation. Then it says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Okay? There's your time of the escape. Now listen to what it says. Luke's discourse ends with these two verses, 37 and 38. And in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple. And at night, he went out and abode in the mount that is called Olives, and all the people came early in the morning for to hear him in the temple. How does John 8 start? He went out into the Mount of Olives and early in the morning they all came unto him to hear him in the temple. And all of a sudden, who's standing before him? This Gentile bride type that he's saying the stone is now going to be thrown. And he's the one standing in the midst of her like he's on one knee writing in the sand. And he looks up and it's only her there. When that wedding's over, what happens? 
He comes as the Son of Man 40 days. I am the light of the world. Anybody who comes to me won't be in darkness. When is he coming? When there will be darkness in northern Israel because the first attack will happen and he's coming at the time of his birth as one coming as light in the darkness. It's crazy. It's so crazy perfect. It, it's almost, it, you can't believe it could be this understood. It's wild. Wild, wild, wild stuff. And so the context that I'm building to is still to say, see, seven is right before all of this takes place, which is just like Luke 12, showing that it's before it takes place, which means what? Which means what? It means that right towards, oh, I was at the wrong spot. I was up there, down here. That right towards the very end, before that final moment of 70 is complete, right before it ends and the true Feast of Weeks is reached in 2023, right before it ends, it's showing that it's still going to be in the very last moment, in the later end, <coughs> excuse me, but still in the 70th year. Do you get it? Because it's happening in John 7. Whereas John 8 is the escape. Is the escape. Is the Lord now before his bride? And then there's his coming for, as 40 days in the darkness after that week. You see? Well, now let me confirm it to you more. Because you guys will remember this. We've got, we've got such incredible teachings about the revelation of the end days seven churches. A mystery that churches have been trying to understand for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's so exciting because as we've shown before, I'm not going to go through, I'm just going to briefly explain. This is the apostles' time of working. They're going to start working. So he's going to meet with those disciples right before the 70 years ends. At the beginning of the 70 years, the beginning of the 50 days, bang, the escape happens. And then the Lord returns, it says, on the same day at evening. And what does he do? He's going to anoint the apostles by... In, in historically, he breathed on them the same day at evening at the start of the 50, after the escape happened. When he breathes on them and they have the anointing of the Holy Ghost, boom, he's now gone to the wedding. But what did he do even before he took the bride and before he met with the apostle group? He's going to instruct Smyrna. Smyrna, his disciple worker Smyrna representation church, are the ones that he's going to meet right before the 70 comes to a complete end. This is the group that when the entirety of tribulation is over, when the 14 years and it comes to an end, and these guys get resurrected to rule and reign with them for a thousand years, it's these guys right here. The, the apostles, the 144,000, and then those who will work during the millennial reign, Revelation chapter 21 tells us that they're part of New Jerusalem coming down. Only Smyrna are those who are being rewarded or recompensed, as it said, at the resurrection of the just, at the resurrection of the dead, the first resurrection. It's these guys right here. And they're the same group we've been talking about in this, in this second portion. <clears throat> it's all that Luke disciple servant workers who he came to meet first, right before it all started. Now, let me prove it to you. You see, we did a teaching on this a while ago, and there was a reason <clears throat> why I was going into some of these other parts and pieces and accentuating them as I was saying them for you guys to remember. Because you'll remember that right now, so there's the was of Old Testament that were typologies of the seven churches. There weren't seven churches back in the Old Testament, but the typologies of them, you see? Typologies. Was, is, is to come. The was shall be, the is shall be. They'll all play out in the is to come. So what played out over thousands of years, what played out over a couple thousand years, will play out over 14. <coughs> and so, <coughs> excuse me. And so, <coughs> excuse me, a little coffee time. And it's finally getting warm out, even at night. It's not too bad. So my heater's on low, almost off. I'm going to take the jacket off. 
So what we end up seeing is this represents the disciples who get that anointing on the on the on the same day at evening when the 50 starts before the Lord leaves for the wedding. <clears throat> but they're going to remain during seals. <clears throat> Their responsibility is the foundation, the spiritual foundation, while a physical foundation is also being built. Smyrna <clears throat> is when he returns from the wedding. The Lord meets with them, gathers them, has a meal and serves them. <clears throat> They're going to have understanding open to them, and they're going to follow him during 40 days. When the 40 days are over, they're going to meet, uh, according to Scripture, back in Jerusalem or in Jerusalem time area still, and they're going to meet with the apostles, and these Smyrna guys will now receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost as well. <coughs> and they're also now, both of these groups are still working during seals, apostles and disciples. Okay? Then what's going to happen? Persecution is going to begin during those 40 days, and it's going to continue. Pergamum represents that time of about mid-seals, or what we call about two and a half years, into the first six years of seals. And the Constantine type is the Antichrist type when he gets his power to continue 42 months. When he gets that power to continue 42 months, that is the time of the mark of the beast, the worshiping and everything else. That is Mark's discourse when they flee into the wilderness. Pretty crazy, right? It's amazing. Then what happens? Thyatira is dark ages because they're still in the wilderness. They're in the wilderness till the sixth year comes to an end. And what do we know happens at the end of the sixth year? The Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion, right? He's going to seal the 144. There's going to be the rapture of the great multitude. He's going to make all, uh, uh, an agreement with nations. And then Jerusalem will be rebuilt. So when does that happen? This is, this is right to the end of the sixth year. This Sardis is the seventh year of seals when the Lord has come. You see the church of reformation historically, the period of Israel's kings. Well, guess what? It's Israel's king coming, right? The house of Israel. It's their king coming, right? It's the rapture of the great multitude. And what's he gonna do at the end of seals? He's going to be Melchizedek, high priest and king, and ruling with the modern day Zerubbabel. But you see, Israel's kings, <clears throat> the Reformation, this is that seventh year. Then it comes to Philadelphia. Philadelphia is the church of the great missionary. That is the 144,000 who are sealed and go out at the beginning of trumpets and go out during the first three and a half years of trumpets while the king of Israel is ruling and reigning and the city and the streets are being rebuilt. You see, this is all happening in that time. And then what happens? At the end of that portion, at the end of the three and a half years of trumpets, the first three and a half, it then becomes the time of Israel's removal. Just so happens that's when Messiah is cut off. And they go, and they go on the wings of an eagle into the place for three and a half years till it's over. And Philadelphia will go out with additional power, the 144. They will receive additional power to step on scorpions and do all that sort of stuff. And these guys can't die. Okay, but this is when Messiah is cut off. <clears throat> and there's, you got Israel's removal. And then look what happens. Then it goes to Laodicea, the apostasy. What do you think happens at mid-trumpets? Satan is cast down, the pit is open, Antichrist comes back, you've got Satan, Antichrist, false prophet, dwelling in some men on the earth, the pit is open, absolute chaos like you could have never imagined, way worse than mid-seals was. And so what happens at mid-trumpets at the apostasy? Matthew's discourse, when they flee into the wilderness in Matthew's discourse. You see how awesome that is? And what's going to happen? This is when he's going to stand in the, the, the place, right? He's going to stand in the temple, in the holy place, because the temple will have been rebuilt in the first three and a half years of trumpets. This is the apostasy. This is 2 Thessalonians, right? Chapter 2, the, 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 uh, um, when the son of perdition comes, okay? He was there for 42 months. Then he was not because the Lord was here and, and Antichrist was killed. Then the pit is open. All these guys come back. It's craziness. 
and they fly in the way in the wilderness to be protected. This is a brief overview that I just gave you of the revelation of the end of days seven churches. In the book, it goes into greater detail. But right now, you see, there was the historical Old Testament typologies of the seven churches. And then there was from the is, which was from Christ, until the moment of the pre-trib escape, we are still living in this right here, the is of the age of the seven churches. And where are we right now? <clears throat> we are in the Laodicean apostasy age. That's why we're having so much difficulty trying to wake the church up and get them to see these things that the time is at hand. They're too busy with the riches and the gold of this world, <clears throat> right? They don't realize that they're naked. You see that? This is why they're all lukewarm, because the Lord told us this is exactly what it has to be before the end begins, and it all starts over again, but this time over 14 years. <clears throat> so what happens if we go read into Laodicea? Remember what I told you. What I'm showing you is more evidence to Luke chapter 12 to build on John chapter 7 to show that the Lord God Jesus himself is, as the Son of Man, going to reveal himself in some fashion to his Smyrna disciple Priscilla Aquila overcoming Dan uh, uh, Ephraim portion. Luke 24, bride remaining remnant workers, he, that he is going to meet with them first, before, right before the pre-trib escape, which means it's going to happen still in the 70th or in this tail end of this seventh year, which is the 70th, which is why it was in John chapter 7 that this conversation was taking place. And you'll remember this if you've been around for a little while. I proved this out in the past, <clears throat> but I did not yet know back then in realizing that this is telling us before. You see? When the seven churches are going to start all over again, and it's going to begin on the same day at evening after the pre-trib escape, it's going to start on the 50th day with Ephesus, go into Smyrna, and the 14 years and the whole end of days, Revelation starting over again with the seven churches. Well, then what would it mean if we're reading things from Laodicea still in the is? Well, that would mean that what we're reading is something still connected to all of this time of the is that we're living in, which is still going to be until the very last moment that 70 is done. That 70 is done, and the moment 71 begins, it's, it's all new. It's all starting. So right before it ends, that final moment, before 70 is absolutely complete, we're still in Laodicea. So if we're still in Laodicea, right until that final moment, and the Lord is speaking to a group of disciples before, in that final moment, before 70 is over, do you think there's a chance we can find revelation and understanding connecting this pre-portion to this disciple group in Laodicea? Let's have a look. Revelation 3, starting in verse 14. And the angel of the Lord said unto the church of the Laodiceans, Write these things that saith the Amen, the Amen, the faithful and true witness. There's one clue, <clears throat> right? What do we know about Christ? You got it. Laodicea, remember in the in the in the in the book, in the picture. Of the seven churches, Laodicea is what? It's connected to mid-trumpets. When the pit is open. When the son of perdition comes. And so what is Christ calling himself in the end time picture of the seven years? He's saying he's one of the true witnesses. Hello. See, we've proven that. That's why the story of Jonah in Luke, Mark, and Matthew were all prophecy and have not played out yet, but that's for another story. So what does he call himself? Uh, the faithful and true witness. The beginning. 
of the creation of God. Isn't that amazing? Right off the bat, he's telling us that he's a witness during this time in the end of days, last three and a half years of trumpets, but at the very end in the is that we're still currently in, he's also saying that he is the beginning. Remember what the revelation of beginning means? Feast of weeks, Taurus. <laughs> I love it. <clears throat> So I know thy works, and thou art neither hot nor cold. I would that thou were hot or uh, cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm. You see, now he's talking to the church as a whole, but it doesn't mean everybody in it is like that. Of course not, right? So it says, but because thou art lukewarm. Isn't that amazing? Because the, the first group connected that's being spoken about is Luke. Why? Because the beginning of the end of days starts with the pre-trib of Luke. Those who are hot are going. You see? Those who are hot in Luke are going. Those who are lukewarm, those that had the chance, those that had the opportunity that turned and went and did something else and fell into the riches of the world, they became lukewarm. They had the option to be Luke. Okay? I will spew thee out of my mouth. Uh, Revelation 3.17 because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold. See, didn't, didn't we just see that connection to the, to the disciple group, right? That would, they would be tried in fire, right? Tried as gold. See, because buy of me gold tried in the fire in this pre portion this right before pre-trib this is our testing our life our being hot for the lord remaining hot for the lord not getting caught up in the things of the world being tried in this fire like gold that thou mayest be rich listen to this and white raiment hello who's the only one that has a white raiment a white garment out of the three discourse, I mean, out of the three synoptic gospels. Luke, Luke, only in Luke was, he, was it a gorgeous robe, which means a white, radiant, beautiful, gorgeous robe. Okay, look at this, Luke chapter 23, a white, radiant, beautiful, gorgeous robe. See, gorgeous, and look at the word, robe, okay? A gorgeous robe, white, radiant, bright clear remember the group that gets white robes those who put their necks on the line right those who put their necks on the line who get those white raiments as well that thou mayest be clothed and that the the shame of thy nakedness be uh, be not appear listen to this and anoint okay only used once for this one, a rubbing anointing of oil on thine eyes with eye slave that thou mayest see. Who is going to be receiving an anointing that they may see, who will receive white robes, who are his witnesses during seals, which is literally like Luke 24. They're called his witnesses, which you don't see in Mark and you don't see in Matthew. You see the connections happening? Well, it gets even more clear if you're not sure. Luke 3.19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You see? Be zealous for the Lord and repent. So earnestly covet and desire. So there are some who are, you see? Because for as many as he loves, he also rebukes and chastens. So behold, here it comes, just in case you weren't sure, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Huh. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Sound familiar? Let's go back to that group in Luke 12. Let's, let's just make sure 
that the entire context of what this was talking about is the same. Let your loins be girded about. Covered it. Right? When he returns from the wedding, what does it say? And when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom when the Lord cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to eat and will come forth and serve them. You see what's happening here? We taught on this before. Here he is, even though it's Laodicea, which is a lukewarm end right before the end of days begin, the overall church is lukewarm. But his message within it is not that everybody is, but there is a group within them that he is talking to. And they are not Laodicea. They're Smyrna. It's a group that he's preparing, that he's pre-telling before the 50 days begins, right towards the end of the 70th, that is built right into it, proving again that there's a conversation of that Luke disciple Smyrna group pre-conversation taking place with these guys. Listen to what it says in Revelation 3.21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down in my father's, in, uh, with my father in his throne. Sounds familiar? Isn't this exactly what we showed earlier in Revelation chapter 20? Judgment is set. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded, Priscilla and Aquila, right? The servants, first fruits, servants for the Lord at the eighth day. Neither received the mark uh, in Revelation 20, verse 4, towards the end. Uh, neither received, neither had received the mark upon, okay? Which means on, by the way, you see? Upon their foreheads, or the word in, you see, it's not actually in. It means on, just like the cloud in Matthew. or on their hands and they lived and reigned with christ a thousand years look see when you reign with christ you're what you're a co-heir with christ you rule and reign with christ as kings and priests and then it says uh, uh and lived with and lived and reigned with christ a thousand years but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection. You see, so when everybody's saying, oh, the resurrection is happening, no. It doesn't happen until the end of tribulation. And it's only one group that's resurrected first. And it is those who are going to rule and reign with them for a thousand years outside of those who were promised the, uh, uh, the millennial reign. Right? Old Testament. So blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. See, Smyrna. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. The only ones that can rule and reign with Christ a thousand years, like we said in the last video, in Romans chapter 8, you see them right there. They are the ones led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit itself bears witness with, with, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God. And this is, this is always the hardest thing to fathom, right? It, it's even hard to read, to be honest. And joint heirs with Christ. Could you imagine walking around claiming yourself to be a joint heir with Christ? That sounds pretty crazy, confident, cocky, arrogant, doesn't it? Could you imagine that? But if you're in Christ, spirit-filled and led by the Spirit, you already are. It's not an arrogance. We're not walking around, hey, too bad for you, sucker. I'm a co-heir with Christ. No, that's not what's going on. It's in your humility. It's, in, it's the Spirit in you as well. You're not living in the flesh, right? You know where real life is and what the truth is of eternity is, is real life. This is just temporary skin flesh covering. They're going to be joint heirs with Christ. What is Christ? King. What is Christ? Priest. 
What is Christ going to do during the millennial reign? Rule as king. You see? So what do you think joint heirs are going to do? Rule and reign as kings and priests. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified, as we said in the last video, together. When's the glorifying happen? At the resurrection, at the first resurrection of those who are joint heirs with Christ, who will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. You see, remember when I told you guys that everybody going pre-trib is part of that mystery? And this was interesting, Yanni, I was talking with our brother Yanni over in Greece today, and uh, our brother John as well. Prayers for our brother John. He was, uh, he's a trucker and he got in an accident and his truck's destroyed, uh, but he is safe and he's okay. But uh, prayers for our brother John as well. So what happened here is, remember with Priscilla and Aquila, and, or sorry, sorry, what I was saying was with um, Yanni, when we go back to the beginning, when we go back to the beginning, what's the biggest mystery of creation? These two verses right here. This is called the mystery. They've called it the gap theory. They've come up with all sorts of things for it. But when Christ became light, there was no longer an issue. We can go, right? Remember there's seven days, six days in the seventh? And then from Adam, there's 6,000 years and then the 7,000th year. And when we went to, when you go to 2 Peter 3, 8, you get the literal revelation of it, right? Listen, oh, I love this, right? 2 Peter 3, 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust, right? Where's the promise of his coming? <laughs> See, we're here, guys. But look at verse 8. 2 Peter 3, verse 8. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. So it's a big deal that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. So what was the creation? Well, after the gap theory creation of verse one and two in Genesis, you have the days, right? You have one, two, three, four, five, six, and the seventh day he rested. So what did he say? He said one day or each day with the Lord is a thousand years each. So if we were there, it would have been a thousand years each. But we weren't there. There was no flesh. There was no existence of time yet. So what was it? Well, with the Lord, they were days. But if we were in the fleshly time realm that we're in now, we would have seen that creation. It would have taken 7,000 years as well. And then you have comma N, which means a separation and addition. So they're two separate portions. And he says, and a thousand years is as one day. Well, from Adam till now, it's, we're talking the 6,000th and then the 7,000th rest. You see? So it's like a Sabbath of uh, uh, seven days of a week. The seventh day is the Sabbath. 6,000 years. The seventh is the Sabbath. You see? But what is it? To the Lord God, it's still only days. But to us in the flesh, it's thousands of years. This is the revelation of creation from day one to the end of the millennial reign which is truly in our physical time if we were there from that day one it would have been a total of fourteen thousand years hence the revelation of 14 years of the end of days this was proven way after the revelation had been proven through many other places of 14 years but where's the gap theory Where's the rest of it? You see? Where's Genesis chapter one? Where, where's Genesis chapter one? Where's this portion before Christ became light? This is the mystery portion. We've revealed it here in this ministry. So incredibly that this right here is Luke's discourse. This of days is Mark's discourse. Chapter two of the thousands represents the seven years of Matthew's discourse. It's unbelievable. You see, the first seven were also 7,000 years to us, but seven to the Lord. But you don't get to find that information about it. You only get a little blip. 
But the revelation comes through Jacob and the revelation of the end of days being seven, 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 and then one, just like the menorah. Seven almond branches, seven almond branches, seven almond branches, and then one, or almond blossoms, right? It's seven, 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 one. Seven years, seven years, seven years, and one. But this is the one that's the greatest mystery. Do you understand why it's a mystery? Do you understand that the entire world for centuries has taught that everything's only seven years or 7,000 years and the end of days is only seven years? Because everybody's thinking is stuck in Matthew. And when it's stuck in Matthew, what do they tell you about the rapture? They will tell you that everybody who calls on the name of Jesus Christ, regardless of whether they're diligent, regardless of whether they're repentant, regardless if they kept with it, they just say, ah, if you called on the name of Jesus, you're going rapture. No, you're not. You see, the great multitude rapture is not the mystery. There is no mystery in the great multitude rapture. It's literally right here in Revelation chapter nine, chapter seven, verse nine. It's not a mystery. This is the one the churches promote to everybody thinking they're talking pre-trip. But because they only understand seven years and they're saying it's the seven years for Matthew, what they don't realize, it's as if they're at the end of Mark's gospel. You see that? Because they've not understood the mystery of the gospels. So the, the mid-trib great multitude rapture, which they think is pre-trib, is actually the one mid-trib before the seven years of trumpets for Matthew. You see why the confusion? It's so beautiful to understand once you grasp it. But this great multitude rapture, that's not the mystery. You see, it's not the mystery. So what is the mystery? Well, this brings us again to Romans chapter 16. There's your group being chosen to work, putting their necks on the line. Those disciple workers, the Luke 24, Smyrna, being told right before everything starts. They're the first fruits unto Christ. They are his laborers during seals. They'll follow him during the 40 days. <clears throat> they will probably be physically translated, by the way, too, like, um, like Philip was with the eunuch. Baptize the eunuch. Eunuch comes out of the water and bang, Philip's already in another city. Eunuch looks around like, what the heck? Oh, all right. All right. That's what's about to happen because they will begin their ministry with the Lord in Jerusalem. So do they go at the beginning of the 50 when he, when he informs them, or is it at the eighth day? Probably at the eighth day. But the reason I'm showing you this is because of how Romans 16 ends. Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the Look at that word, Revelation. Look familiar? Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. This is the, remember this? This is the same revelation that's connected to those of the workers. And what's going to happen right after that moment? The pre-trib mystery. That pre-trib group that nobody has fully come to understand, but somewhere. There are people that do understand it, but can't understand why they understand it, if that makes any sense. Remember that TV show, The Leftovers? They talked about about 2% of the population of the world vanished. It was about 144 million. All right, I think they said about 140 million or something. That blew my mind when I heard that because I revealed that through scripture. It'll be 1.8% of the population of the world. It will hit 8 billion right at that point. No, we're not at 8 billion yet. We're almost. Some say yes, some say no. We're not there yet. At the pre-trib escape, it'll be 8 billion. And about 1.8% will be taken. And it will be 144 million people. And that is the group that is going to be the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. You see that? Verse 26, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known 
to all nations for the obedience of faith. This is also prophetic. It is prophecy. What is it that is kept secret? That, that pre-trib group, that devout Enoch type, diligently seeking, believing in the reward of the Lord group, which also consists of the Priscilla's and the Aquila's. That's why it's also <coughs> the mystery which was kept secret. Who do we know was kept secret, brothers and sisters? Exactly, it takes us right back to 1 Peter. That group that was kept secret, what? Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, in the end of days. You see, it's the mystery of the beginning of creation. It's that part that was still all in darkness before the Lord was made light. That's why it was a mystery. He came and then shone his light on day one, right at the time of the start before day one. And then you've got him coming at this 40 days to shine light in the darkness. And all the scriptures we covered connecting it. And what happened? <clears throat> They've been made manifest, right? It says, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Who had the obedience of faith? All the nations? No. Those who were in Christ, the pre-trib group, the mystery that was kept secret. You see, and all nations are now going to be aware of it. Why do you think that is? Look at 2nd Esdras in the Apocrypha. They're going to be in bewilderment. Everybody who's left on the earth, all nations will be in bewilderment after the Most High delivered that mystery that, were on, that was on the earth, right? After he will deliver those who are upon the earth. The bewilderment of mind of everybody that's left. It's, it's just like Luke 21. They'll all be caught left in the snare. <clears throat> and they're going to be in a panic. Could you imagine... 90% of those in the church claiming Christ being left wondering what on earth has happened. It cannot have been the pre-trib. It cannot have been the rapture that I heard the crazy Christians talking about. Because I'm still here and I believe in Jesus. <clears throat> My pastor told me, if I believe in Jesus, don't worry, you're all pre-trib. That ain't the case. It's about to be made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. And it's the mystery that was kept secret from the beginning. And it is those who are spirit filled that are what? Sons of God, of the spirit in the verse one and two of Genesis one creation. And you see this, but now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets. Do you know why the prophets do you know the prophets? Some people think that, oh, looking for the season and time and trying to discern and understand this timing of Christ and his coming, you guys are foolish, nobody should do it. No. Do you guys realize the actual prophets were doing it? It tells us right here. When we come back into 1 Peter uh, verse 8 at the appearing of Christ, see, um, starting in verse 8, whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, Yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Hello. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Why? Because at the appearing, we'll be in the presence of our faith. We'll be given understanding for that worker remnant. They'll be anointed with the Holy Ghost with power and authority. Filled with the understanding. There is no more faith when you're standing in his presence. So then what happens? Verse 10 and 11, 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. 
Hello. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things. Man. How could we not be excited about this? <laughs> this I mean, come on. It's so over the top, filled with revelation and understanding. I mean, it's all there before our eyes. We just need to be diligent. We need to be as Enoch was, diligently ser searching the scriptures. And when we have a place like this, where we can literally see the revelation being revealed and unfolded from the beginning to the end of the book, that Daniel was told to seal up till the time of the end. This is why I'm so passionate. I, I can't believe it's happening. <laughs> That's what's really going on. I cannot believe this has really been happening through me for five and a half years. And I <laughs> never in a million years would I have thought this. I mean, not even close. Nobody who knew me would have thought this in a million years. Yet I wouldn't change it for a million more years. When you, when you ponder what it all means in, being underst in understanding that it's being revealed, <laughs> do you know what it means? It means the Father God himself in Christ Jesus instructed the Holy Ghost to make the revelation known, to begin to open it, to lead in it, and as the Spirit leads, and I have no real idea, I'm just reading. The Spirit reveals. And for each and every one of you who follow through, who seek and search out every single one of these teachings and discern them and spend time and diligently search them out as Enoch did. Do you see what I'm talking about now when it comes to the discernment? It's impossible. How could we learn prophecy through everybody else stuck in Matthew foundations? How on earth? You see, we might be able to pull tidbits out of some of their teachings, absolutely. But to go and get full teachings and say, here it is and here it is, absolutely not. Otherwise, there would have been no reason to open the books for the end of days. We don't have all discernment, of course not. But we have been given more discernment of the revelation of the end of days than has ever been revealed in history with understanding. That is not tooting my horn and oh, so boastful. No. It's to, it's to show you that the revelation is true. And I do believe with all my heart, we are absolutely in the final seven years of the next coming seven and seven that we are truly in the tail end of the 70th year and the entire story is laid out right here in these pages from scripture from genesis 1 to revelation 22 the entire picture is laid out and it goes all the way back perfectly aligned to the birth of Christ, to the beginning of his walk with John for one year, and the beginning of his ministry for the next three and a half and change years. Each and every part directly in line with the revelation of the end of days from Scripture. Not only 70 ending for Israel and the 14 beginning, but when the 14 is over, the 70 of Jerusalem is also over. So it makes no difference which way you want to call it from. The 70s end at the same connection. The start of 14 and the end of 14. Brothers and sisters, I pray this has blessed you. 
some of these videos, I mean, it happens often. You know, I, you, you guys see how I always get fired up. I can't help it because I just, I am so mind melted that this is happening. You know, I was talking with Petra for two hours yesterday and we were having conversations on all sorts of different things and, and this kind of topic as well, just with what she does in the revelation she gets in her dreams and in her visions and her words with the Lord. And to know with discernment by going into scripture, I can understand and back what she's saying, whereas most people I can't. That's why we have such a connection. That's why when you understand what it means, not only for me, not only for Petra, but for each and every one of you who is beginning to understand in part, in portion, in, in the whole picture, that means the Father had to instruct the Spirit through Christ to say, unlock that one too. Unlock that one. Open that heart. Open that Spirit there. Do you know why? Because the Scripture said we were predetermined predetermined here's the thing though as i finish up we don't know who everybody is so to be to, for the father to have it predetermined is wonderful but as i've said in the past it makes no difference because you won't know it until you're there so you have to remain diligent you have to remain repentant and seeking the lord and in love because you can fall away. So you can't just walk around boastful or proud or, you know, cocky and arrogant thinking, ah, I'm part of the predetermined. You can have confidence, a humility in confidence that you're part of it because of what you're understanding, because of what you're taking part in, because you're diligently seeking and so forth. But if you don't remain in it, Oops. You see? This is the truth that you're going to get here. You're not going to get the wishy-washy saying, oh, as long as you say you believe in Jesus, you're going to heaven. You're going pre-trib. Everybody's going. It's not true. So don't believe it. And if you can share with others not to believe that as well, then hallelujah, help some more. Because we have to be diligent. You have to be in the Lord. You have to be spirit-filled in Christ. Let me finish it with this one for new ones, for those new people that might still be around. You see, 2 Corinthians 12, 2, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, and it's like a rapture that goes to the third heaven. Look at the group who gets to go in the rapture in the was caught up of the great multitude of Revelation 7 that goes to paradise. Look at what it says about them. And I knew such a man. See that? The first one is in Christ. The second one that had to go through seals is called eh, like a man, kind of like the first one, but not really. Is that what you want to be? You want to be such a man? Or would you rather be a man in Christ, male or female? Man in Christ. Difference is up to you, right? I'll go for in Christ. Thank you very much. So awesome. God is good, brothers and sisters. Time is short. Prayers for our brother John again. Prayers for our brother Steve Owenie over in Uganda and all the work that he's doing. Anybody who can support, please do. We want to do as much as we can before everything changes. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. I hope this blesses you as it blesses me and excites me to share with all of you. God bless you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.